very much, Cahirlach, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss with you today the report of the independent review group that was established by the Minister for Health in 2017 to examine the role of voluntary organisations in publicly funded health and personal social services. Um, very briefly, our terms of reference asked us to carry out a factual analysis, including um, of issues relating to faith-based voluntary organisations and to do a consultation and make recommendations on future relations between the state and the voluntary sector. And this led us to establish an evidence base, which included drawing on previous reports, because there have been many. Um, it led us to meet with stakeholders, and we had over 40 meetings with stakeholders. We undertook a public consultation, to which we got over 100 replies, and we got many written submissions. And we also felt it was important to compare the situation in Ireland with that in other countries, in particular other EU countries. And I think our main finding can be summed up as follows, that in our view, the state and the voluntary sector need each other. Uh, we say this um, with a lot of evidence in the report, but primarily because the voluntary sector provides 28% of inpatient hospital beds and two-thirds of disability services. Um, on the other side, the state pays 3.3 billion to the voluntary sector to provide these services. So that's why we say that each, each needs the other. And we recommend recognizing this reality and making a new start through building a new relationship of mutual trust and respect between the parties. We say that because in our report we explain how and why we believe the relationship between the voluntary sector and the HSE has broken down and why it's necessary to find better ways of working together. In our view, this should be done through state recognition of the role and the value of the voluntary sector and by recognising its separate legal status. Equally, the voluntary sector must recognise that it's an integral part of the overall health and personal social care system with all the duties and responsibilities that arise from that. And so we propose giving this recognition through the creation of a charter and a forum basically where the voluntary sector and the state uh, can interact on a permanent basis. So we're recommending a two-way process of consultation, early involvement, listening and learning to each other as a way of delivering a genuine partnership, such as we have seen uh, exists in several other EU countries. Again, drawing on wider EU experience, we recommend moving over time to a system where the state decides in early and real consultation with the voluntary sector on a list of essential services to be delivered to the public. That list should be based, in our view, on full cost pricing for the delivery of these services with fire prices that are fixed nationally. There could be room for some regional variation, but basically we think they should be fixed nationally. And if, um, along the road to this um, way of delivering services, a first step would be to improve data and to map service needs across the country. So we also recommend including a map of those services that are hard to replace in order to ensure continuity of service in the case of withdrawal of certain key service providers. Um, we also recommend that the state should either apply or fix national standards for commission services and obviously the list would require regular updating. We think that such a process would be more patient-centred providing greater certainty and availability and affordability of services. And it would have the benefit of moving the dialogue between the HSE and the voluntary sector away from the current overwhelming focus on funding to the type of services that are to be delivered and to focus instead on the quality and the outcomes of these services. In addition to uh, hoping to put relations between the HSE and the voluntary sector on a new footing, we recommend separating the commissioning and the service provider roles of the HSE. We also recommend making the HSE more accountable to the Minister and the Department of Health. And we also recommend a stronger and more visible role for the Department of Health, including ensuring more joined up services for users and fostering greater cooperation between government departments and agencies in order to reduce unnecessary duplication. We also point out that the voluntary sector needs to modernise and improve its own governance, uh, striving to avoid duplication and accepting that it is part of delivering a national health service that requires it to take wider considerations into account. 
Um, then with specific reference to the faith-based organisations that were part of our terms of reference, we carried out a detailed analysis to establish how many there actually are and who actually owns them, and particularly in the annexes to report, our report you can find all the detail on that. Um, again, in summary, because time is short, um, of the 48 public and accused hospitals in the state, we concluded that 14 are voluntary, and we further concluded that um, as many as 12 of them still have some degree of faith-based ownership or governance involvement. Now, this is a situation that's changing, uh, new decisions are being taken, and we would foresee that the number of faith-based hospitals will be reduced to only four um, in the coming years. We looked at the mission statements of faith-based organisations, we examined how they provide access to services, we looked at issues around ethos and decor, and we looked at the range of services they provide. And we made recommendations both to those organisations and to the state um, in the light of previous experience. And, and just one example I'll quote. Um, on the issue of co-ownership, we recommend that in future, the state should own the land and the buildings of publicly funded hospitals. And where this is not possible, that financing and governance arrangements should be agreed in advance before funding decisions are taken. So to conclude, we met a very wide range of very dedicated public service minded people in the course of our work. Uh, and we want to thank them for their input. We also met with high levels of frustration, both in the voluntary sector and in the HSE. And we believe, therefore, that a new beginning is needed if we are all to benefit from the positive contribution of the voluntary sector that is described in more detail in our report. Um, other countries have found ways of working with the voluntary sector in mutually beneficial partnerships, and we've believed that this is possible here too, provided a new relationship is developed based on mutual trust and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Day. Now, could I ask uh, Ms. Mo Flynn to make your opening statement? Oh, Kathleen, yes. Kathleen, yes. Kathleen yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you and indeed all the members of the committee for the opportunity to address you here today uh, on the report commissioned by the rehab group which you'll be familiar with called Who Cares and like that building a new relationship between the sector and the state. And although there's no direct relationship or connection between our report and uh, the report of the independent review group, in fact coincidentally the, uh, our report and our research was carried out uh, around the same time and we, while we published before the IRG report, in fact our recommendations are very close uh, uh, to the, those of the independent review group. But let me tell you first why we, why we commissioned the report and many of you will be familiar with it because you attended the briefing which was facilitated by Senator Dolan last November when we published it. Um, so it was actually early in 2017 that we asked Dr Chris McInerney of University of Limerick to carry out this research because we and our colleagues indeed in the Section 39 sector, in the disability sector, had a sense that you know, not only were we facing a lot of challenges but basically something was wrong and we wanted to establish really what that was. So he looked at the, the larger Section 39s and as coincidentally as it happens, these are disability uh, providers. Um, and this in itself is interesting because as you know, Section 39s are supposed to be providing services which are quote unquote ancillary uh, to those being provided by the state. But Rehab Care, which is a division of the Rehab Group, which you're, and you're familiar with Rehab Care, is funded to the tune of right now this year 65 million euro uh, to provide disability services. Now this is hardly ancillary. Uh, we're the largest Section 39 organisation and we would argue that our services, no more than the services of other large Section 39s, are anything but ancillary. Uh, they're vital. Uh, the day services, residential and respite services which we provide are essential to those who use them every day. And this is the first thing I think to realise, that Section 39s are not ancillary. We're core and we're central to the delivery of a vital part of the health services uh, here in this country. But we, what our, our report found is that our future is very uncertain. The extent of the challenges we're facing right now means that our future as a sector is anything but secure. And which means that the services that we provide don't have a secure future either. Uh, the whole sector is standing at a crossroads and the core issue right now, the immediate urgent issue, is funding. And we and, and colleagues will be talking quite a lot about that here this morning. The issue is the adequacy of funding and the funding relationship and the wider relationship between ourselves and the state, uh, represented by the HSE, but broader than that as well. 
a hangover from the recessionary years, from the recession years, is that many of us are carrying you know, a deficit as a result of underfunding. And this is now making us financially uh, unsustainable. You'll be aware uh, in the last number of weeks, the month of May in particular, of our efforts in rehab to secure more, more funding. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your support uh, in our efforts there and to, you know, to thank you because thanks to, thanks to those efforts, the Minister, the Government did agree uh, to provide us with the essential funding that we needed, and which means that now the services that we provide are at least um, are definitely are, are secure. And we're not the only organisation that's been facing financial sustainability issues, and we told you about that at that time. The issue of deficits has been called out by the members of the Independent Review Group, and in particular, the recommendation that that issue be resolved is one that we would strongly support, and indeed ask the committee to call on the Minister for Health to establish a time-bound process, an urgent time-bound process, to have that happen as soon as possible. We want today to be the start of something. Uh, you know, we are really pleased to be here to outline the issues to you. Um, we, we have the IRG recommendations. They're very powerful, they're very clear, and we're very, very supportive of them. But the key piece is that they have to be implemented. And what we need and want is a process to ensure that that happens. I'd like to hand over to CEO Mo Flynn to discuss the issue further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose I need to say that it's absolutely no surprise to us that the findings of the Rehab Group's commissioned report, Who Cares, are really mirrored in the Independent Review Group's report. The messages and the conclusions in both reports are clear and consistent. The independent voluntary disability service providers operate in the absence of a government strategy on, for our role and future, and also in the absence of adequate funding for our services. Our warning is that this will soon be unsustainable. Those impacted because of this uncertain future are the people who rely on our residential, respite and day service, and who deserve to live full lives as citizens of the state with the support that they need. The Who Cares report and the IRG report both concluded that the relationship between the state and the independent voluntary sector has deteriorated and there is an urgent need to place it on a new footing. Conclusions of the Who Cares report can help us design a roadmap which would see the independent voluntary sector working in partnership with government bodies to provide services for people with disabilities which promotes, protects and ensures their full and equal enjoyment of all human rights while re promoting respect for their inherent dignity. These objectives are outlined in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which the voluntary sector campaigned for and the government ratified this last year. We should all be on the same page on this. You will hear more details from our colleagues in the sector about the deficits organisations are having to deal with, but our research findings highlighted that the HSE is not paying the full economic costs for services delivered, organisations have exhausted their economic reserves, board members are no longer willing to operate outside the law on this, and without change, more organisations will be forced to close down. Step one of a roadmap involves the government bodies paying the full cost of the delivery of services and dealing with the immediate and urgent problem of the deficits in these organisations. As we experienced recently in rehab care, many independent voluntary sector service providers are just a few short steps from closing down essential services for vulnerable people. It could only be a matter of time before some reluctantly hand back the keys to the HSE. I'd like the, to ask the committee, as well as the government officials here today, what will the HSE do when the deficits are too big for these voluntary organisations to bear? What happens when board members refuse to trade recklessly under company law and organisations are forced to close down? What is your plan B when, and not if, but when, this happens? What happens to the thousands of vulnerable people who use the services throughout the country when the doors are shut? As a matter of urgency, the current financial deficits facing these organisations need to be addressed by an independent reviewer. Ultimately, the state must pay the full cost of delivering the services. Step two, we would see, is that the independent voluntary sector must build a new relationship working in partnership with the state organisations. 
we should be working towards one goal, providing services for people with disabilities which protects and promotes their human rights. So why is that not at the core of the relationship? And step three, we need a, to develop a compact to govern this relationship where there is a clear vision and principles for interaction. I would also suggest that the government create a junior ministerial portfolio within the Department of the Taoiseach, which would cover the strategic relationship with the community and independent voluntary sector, including the compact. We have a responsibility to get this right for the people who rely on our training and education, residential, respite and day services, and who deserve to live full lives as citizens of this state with the support that they need. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Flynn. And can I now call on Mr. Bernard O'Regan from the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies to make your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. And Anna and I will share the opening statement between us. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address you today on behalf of the 59 service providers who are members of the National Federation and, more importantly, on behalf of the thousands of children and adults with an intellectual disability and or autism uh, and their families uh, to discuss our concerns for the future of voluntary organisations. The Federation is the umbrella organisation of voluntary agencies that provide approximately 85% of this country's direct support services to over 25,000 children and adults with intellectual disability. All providers are governed by volunteer boards of directors, of whom there are about 395 volunteers uh, involved currently, and are subject to a wide range of regulation, ranging from HICWA to company law and housing regulations, where the provider is also an approved housing body. The disability sector is facing a critical challenge in 2019, owing to financial constraints, which if not addressed in a comprehensive way, will have serious repercussions for service provision, which will impact on people with disabilities and their families. In 2017, financial losses occurred in 23 member organisations, for which full accounts are publicly available. The combined deficits of these companies was 25.2 million in 2017. Some boards that are carrying operational deficits are unable to sign service agreements as effectively they would be signing on a reckless trading situation, which is contrary to their legal obligation as directors of companies limited by guarantee. Some have signed the service agreement as a good faith gesture in anticipation of addressing the underlying funding deficit as part of an engagement process with the HSE. However, if the deficit is not addressed, those agencies will be left with no option but to cut services, transfer services to the HSE or enter into a voluntary liquidation process. A number of key drivers have led to this situation, and we've supplied you with some supporting documentation which you can read, which has more information, but we do want to highlight the following. Providers have frequently felt forced to implement cost-increasing measures following HICWA inspections to avoid being in breach of the law and facing closure orders. Boards of directors are faced with the unenviable task of meeting the terms of HICWA regulation or face legal proceedings, which have often led to creating financial deficits. And secondly, the changing needs of people in services, together with the higher standards required resulting from regulation, are the other most significant cost driver in voluntary agencies at present. Due to the lack of appropriate supports, thousands of citizens with ID are not being supported to live lives of their choosing or to maximise their potential and live as independently as possible as contributing active citizens. In addition to the personal cost, this is not compliant with the requirements of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which Ireland has ratified. Older family members are trapped in unsustainable caring roles in the community due to a lack of investment in planned supports. And families are forced to watch key milestones of their child's development pass without appropriate intervention due to waiting lists. And in the most distressing cases, children and young people moving into full-time care on an unplanned basis. And I'll hand you over to Anna. Thank you. Um, so, Chairman and Members, Despite the scale of service delivery by the members of the National Federation of Voluntary Bodies, which uh, is 1.3 billion for clarity, financial deficits relate in the main to compliance with HICWA regulatory standards and the need to respond to urgent support needs of children and adults. 
It's also critical to note that the required expenditure reduction over the period 2009 to 2016 and the continued maintenance of agreed service levels over that period is central to the understanding the current financial sustainability predicament presents. We cannot close wards like the acute care sector. That needs to be made clear. These are people's homes and their regular days. As providers, our members have exhausted all possible savings across management, administration, maintenance and non-pay. In addition to savings achieved through efficiencies, roster reviews, service innovations and attendant management initiatives. There is a significant risk for the state in terms of the financial viability of voluntary disability provider sector, where there are verified deficits totalling circa 25 million in the annual financial statements of those companies of 2017. It's important to note the vulnerable position of volunteer company directors that are faced with intensive demands to deliver services whilst meeting extremely demanding regulatory compliance, which has created a significant burden in both professional and reputational terms for those concerned. The degree to which these significant stakeholders can maintain their position should be of particular concern in terms of their organisational resilience and capacity to continue indefinitely to maintain organisational service delivery. The disability social care service for the avoidance of doubt is in a seriously weakened state in terms of financial stability and organisational resilience. This represents a serious risk for service users who rely on our services and who are at risk in that context. The provision of support from the HSE, including provision of cash liquidity to ensure day-to-day -day operations are maintained, has provided some remedy for the organisations concerned. However, it cannot and will not provide the necessary ultimate solution to ensure ongoing and resilient voluntary provider sector into the future. So moving towards finding solutions to establish me immediate and longer term resolution to these challenges, together with our colleagues we would recommend there is an urgent need for the state and voluntary sector to work together to implement in full the recommendations of the independent review group. Its recommendations challenges all stakeholders, voluntary and statutory, and provides a framework for addressing the urgent challenge facing it all, the future of the citizens of Ireland with disabilities. There is a need for an urgent financial investment on the part of the state to resolve the unsustainable deficit situation. Companies will fold. There is an urgent need for a multi-annual investment programme to address the unmet need outlined in the supporting document that we have tabled, Chairman, and in the Working Group 1 report developed by HSE as part of the Transforming Lives programme. There is a requirement for consideration of a change in the approach to the application of the Health Act 2013 regulations, so HICWA regulations, that moves from a position of compliance to a model of service user outcome. This should include a legal obligation to have regard to the financial resources available prior to compliance plans being developed and accepted. The state and service providers must work together to innovate and develop new models of integrated service delivery in accordance with Sláinte harnessing the capacities of the community and voluntary sector in the provision of effective social care to persons with disabilities as citizens of Ireland. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms Shakespeare. And now, finally, can I call on uh, Rosemary Kyo from the Not-for-Profit Association to make your opening statement. Thank you, Cahir and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to present today on behalf of the Not-for-Profit Association and the tens of thousands of people we provide services to. The report of the Independent Review Group recognises that Ireland owes a debt of gratitude to the voluntary sector, which was the first to provide hospital and social care services at a time when the state did not. The current crisis in the sector, as outlined this morning by my colleagues, calls into question the value the state now places on the sector, and more importantly, how the state prioritises the rights of the people who depend on the services that our sector provides. The sector has grown to provide two-thirds of all services to people with disabilities on behalf of the state, and the continued delivery of those services is now dependent on the financial sustainability of voluntary organisations. The Not-for-Profit Association represents the largest independent national not-for-profit organisations that are engaged in the provision of essential social care services on behalf of the state. 
Collectively, our seven member organisations manage an annual service delivery budget of over €200 million Euro on behalf of the state. We employ 7,000 people in delivering services to over 30,000 adults and children in every part of the country. Notwithstanding the distinctions between Section 38 and Section 39 funded organisations, as set out in the 2004 Health Act, we provide direct services on behalf of the HSE under the mandate of the service arrangement process. The services we provide are essential, they are not ancillary, and annually they include 1.8 million hours of personal assistance services, 150 days of services in our centres around the country, 40,000 respite nights, 125,000 clinical interventions, as well as a wide range of other person-centred services, including training, education, employment and independent living. What happens to those services if our organisations can no longer provide them? The continued delivery of those services is now under immediate threat. Our member organisations are struggling to remain financially viable, some to the point of existential crisis, following years of cumulative deficits that have eroded financial reserves. These deficits have arisen due to austerity cuts that have never been restored, additional costs of compliance and regulation, ageing infrastructure and general inflationary cost increases as the economy continues to grow and where there has been no equivalent increase in state funding for the services provided. In 2018, not-for-profit association member organisations report a combined deficit of €8.3 million, Euro, directly attributable to the shortfall between the cost of delivering services on behalf of the HSE and the funding allocated by the HSE for those services. For 10 years, our member organisations have subsidised the cost of providing services on behalf of the HSE from our own independently generated income and reserves. Those reserves are now depleted and continued delivery of services is under immediate threat. Should our organisations have to cease providing services, the HSE will be required to resource and reinstate these services at full cost and with no scope for any savings for the Exchequer. The issue of deficits for our organisations is compounded by the HSE's ongoing assistance that deficits are not recorded in the annual service arrangement process and are therefore not provided for in funding allocations and presumably not included by the Department of Health for consideration in future year budgets and in strategic service planning. This is further compounded where service providers do record those deficits in service arrangements, thereby reflecting the true cost of delivering services, and the HSE then threatens withholding of 20% of the already inadequate funding, further compromising service delivery. This practice also completely disregards and undermines our organisation's obligations under statutory corporate governance requirements as companies limited by guarantee to ensure the accuracy of information contained in legally binding contracts. The state's regard for the sector is evident in its recent handling of the pay restoration process for Section 39 employees. Having had funding cut to ensure our employees took the same austerity cuts as public sector staff did under FEMPI, those employees were left out of the original pu public sector pay restoration process that began in 2016. Late last year, the HSE agreed a process of partial pay restoration for employees from just 38 out of over 2,000 Section 39 organisations. That will see these staff return to only 2008, 2008 rates of pay by October 2021. Recent communications from the HSE state there will be no funding for the pension element of pay restoration, when historically service funding from the HSE has always covered the pension element of service-related pay. Our organisations, already operating at significant deficits arising from HSE underfunding, cannot fund the pension costs arising from pay restoration. This will likely lead to further industrial action, which in turn will have a detrimental impact on service delivery and the lives of the people who depend on it. This recent communication also states, states that there is no expectation or requirement for Section 39 employees to be aligned with health service salaries. This is a seeming contradiction to the service arrangement process which states the requirement to have regard for public sector pay scales and the decades-long practice of funding Section 39 pay at public pay rates. We now have a two-tier system for pay for social care workers, with those in the voluntary sector lagging behind their public sector peers for doing exactly the same work. In a full employment economy, this has created huge challenges for staff recruitment and retention, with the knock-on impact on service delivery already evident in our organisations. The publication of the IRG report should serve as a defining moment in preserving the positive impacts of the voluntary sector and its recommendations the anchor that underpins a new relationship between the state and the sector. 
Failure to urgently implement the report's recommendations will result in many voluntary organisations being forced to terminate services. The biggest losers in this scenario will be the tens of thousand people across the country that rely on our organisations for these essential services. The government was able to find €3 billion Euro to connect people virtually to the national broadband. We ask now what is the government prepared to do before it's too late to connect tens of thousands of vulnerable people dependent on the services provided by voluntary organisations to their communities and to society. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Keogh. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I have to vacate the chair uh, at the moment and Deputy O'Reilly is going to take the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Morning, all. <laughs> I'll try and pick up now where the chair left off. So I'm going to open to the floor um, for questions if I can. But first, I have one or two questions of my own, if, that, if, if that's okay. Um, and I'll try and keep mine brief because I, I know that, that there are people who are waiting who have questions. With regard to the operation of the deficits and the manner in which that, that, that happens. The phrase trading recklessly was used, I think, by, by, more than, uh, by more than one person. But you might maybe describe for us, one, the impact on the organisation, because obviously that's, that, 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 that's, going to be, uh, that, that's going to be dramatic. But secondly, the potential impact on service users. So for the organisation and for staff to read in the paper that there's a deficit, obviously that's very, very worrying. But that, in turn, has uh, an impact on service users. Also, I note the use of the phrase, um, let me see if I can find it, more than a little coercive. And you might describe for us what exactly that behaviour is like and how it manifests itself, because that's a fairly serious um, charge. And the notion that people are being somehow coerced into signing service level agreements when they know that they're not going to be in a position to deliver those but they also know that without signing them, they find themselves in a position where their funding uh, may be cut off. So you might just describe for us, because that, that phrase is, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm quoting um, di directly from, uh, from at least one of the reports, and that phrase is one that jumped out at me and, and I found very concerning. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to take that, Louise, if that's okay. Yeah. I suppose when we talk about uh, coercive behaviour, and you, you've, you've summed it up, I think, pretty well yourself there, the HSE under the service arrangement process require all organisations to sign service arrangements by the 28th of February every year. There was a change in that practice, I think, that was introduced around 2015, 2016, where organisations were then told that if they hadn't signed by the 28th of February, or indeed if they had signed the service arrangements but had declared deficits, they would be faced with a 20% withholding of funding for those services until such a time as they did sign the service arrangements mm. with no deficits. My own organisation, the Irish Wheelchair Association, which I'm CEO of, received a letter as recently as yesterday from the HSE advising us that because we have shown deficits in our service arrangements for this year, accurately reflecting the cost of delivering those services, mm -hmm that we will now be faced with a 20% withholding of funding. And for me, if that doesn't demonstrate coercion, I don't know what does. I, I, think, you're, I think you're right. Does anyone else want to contribute? Um, I, I think I, I would echo my, my colleague's viewpoint in that uh, we similarly in rehab uh, faced the same position in 2017 where we decided to include all of our deficits in our uh, 60 or 9 service arrangements around the country. Uh, the HSE moved to uh, in, uh, impact the 20% withholding. Uh, we at that stage uh, exercised our right under the service arrangement to enter into the dispute resolution process and under that uh, we were able to demonstrate very clearly that the HSC had no uh, legal uh, right under the service arrangement to withhold that funding <coughs> and therefore once we had demonstrated that they re uh, rescinded that in relation to us. However, we are a large organisation and we are able to enter into that and had the capacity to withhold, manage that for the period of time. For many smaller organisations, the withholding of 20% of funding on a monthly cash flow basis is incredibly difficult and poses considerable 
considerable challenges in terms of meeting both pay costs, uh, service delivery costs, etc. And for many, it pushes them uh, to the extent where they really have to sign in the way in which the HSE has indicated, and that is primarily by not demonstrating that there are any deficits. And I, I think, again, I would echo my colleague, wh whereby we continue to produce service arrangements that are public documents that indicate that there are no deficits, then we feed into this myth that there are no deficits in the sector. And we've been all doing this now for a good number of years. And as a result, there is no public recognition, um, or indeed within the health budgets, or recognition that those deficits are accumulating. So this is something that is very much under the radar. And I think it is only in our efforts, and I think essentially through what emerged from the IRG report, is that those deficits have now become uh, more public knowledge than, and the process that's been initiated has been public knowledge. Sure the general public recognise the deficits, the service users do, the people who are working, in, uh, but unfortunately the department seems uh, either unable or unwilling to, to recognise those deficits and you know, th presumably that has an impact then on your capacity to plan um, on a year by year basis. Sorry, yeah, maybe just to comment on the first part of your uh, question as well, and, and to support everything that, that um, has been said in relation to the, the experience with service agreements, which our own members would uh, experience as well. I think for, for um, boards of directors, they're, they're placed in a very difficult situation. They're asked to, to govern organisations providing services to people with disabilities, which is their core purpose. It's the only reason that they exist. Um, and they're very driven by a commitment to people with disabilities to provide the best services that they can and to respond to their needs. And they're doing that in, in an environment that's changed dramatically over the last five to ten years with a level of compliance uh, around lots of different regulation that's very different to how it used to be, for the better, but it has uh, come with consequences, much of which wasn't properly planned for or anticipated or, or costed in terms of, of the potential implications. So directors are, are governing organisations which they, they must meet all those requirements, and at the same time, they're very conscious of the unmet needs that are there and trying to, to respond to those. And they're being placed in situations where there isn't proper and adequate funding for the actual cost of the services they're being asked to provide and yet to provide the services at the level that's expected. And, and they're, they're in this unenviable position. And to continue to do both of those things without the adequate funding places them in a situation where they don't have the finances to be able to do it, and yet they're driven by both the regulation and the need at the same time. The effect on, on, on the people that we support is that either one, they're not getting access to the services that they need, um, or secondly, their confidence in the services that they are in receipt of and their sustainability into the future is always in doubt. Yeah. So families who have battled for services and have got them feel that they have to battle continuously to maintain them, yeah. rather than being able to say, we've won this war and we can now move on with other parts of our lives. Yeah, no, and I think I, I, I saw that in, in my own community as well. Maybe I could just come in on this um, from the point of view of, of uh, what we found in um, preparing our report. We were um, surprised to hear about these deficits and very surprised to hear that they couldn't be mentioned in the service uh, agreements. Now, what we pointed out was a, I don't think there is an overall, an overview of the size of these deficits. And so we recommended that um, a survey should be carried out to establish how much are we talking about. Um, but also uh, we felt from what we heard that the way in which the HSE negotiates the service agreements was to start by saying you got X last year, we're going to start at X minus so much this year. So the whole process is designed to try to squeeze down the costs and in itself that's you know obvious you have to manage public money. But um, there was no discussion about well then what services will you not provide if we give you less money? And what um, has been described about then the 20% cut coming in, mm -hmm. we also tried to explore that with the HSE and with the organisations. And um, what we also heard was that um, because the 20% cut jeopardises the delivery of the services, 
Um, then late in the year, the HSE would come in with emergency financing to keep things going. So our recommendation in terms of overall management of this mm -hmm. is that A, there has to be a survey of how much is the deficit and then a plan for uh, eliminating it either with more money or by deciding to not make services available. Those, there aren't many options. Mm -hmm. Um, secondly, to move to a system of full cost pricing where the organisations have to be paid uh, for the service that they provide. And thirdly, to move to multi-annual budgets so that the organisations would be able to make a reasonable plan and to give reasonable certainty to the uh, service users. Okay, thank you. And in your report, you, you say that, the, and in your, your statement, you say that there should be a stronger and more visible role for the department. <coughs> and would you see that being in terms of the multi-annual funding? I mean, at the moment, presumably the role is, is not strong enough and not visible enough. So in, in what areas do you, do you recommend improvement? Well, um, behind um, the day-to-day -day delivery is the policy, the health policy. Mm. And because the HSE is so big, um, a, a lot of the responsibility has been delegated to them. And until fairly recently, they didn't even have a board to hold them accountable in some way. And we felt that there was a little bit too much distance between the department mm. and what the actual conduct and the way the policy is being implemented by the HSE. And uh, while um, there's lots of international practice about delegating um, wor work like the HSE does to agencies, um, experience also shows that in the end the political responsibility comes back to the minister and the department. And given that, we felt that there should be a stronger line of communication, including of signalling problems um, between the HSE and the department. Mm -hmm. Can I just get the views of the representative groups as well in terms of the relationship with the department and the description that it needs to be uh, stronger and more visible? I mean, would, you, would you share that? Is it easy to get access to the department? Do you feel that you're being listened to? No, I mean, I, I would absolutely wholeheartedly agree with the recommendation in Catherine's report. Our relationship is with the HSE. We don't have really any inroad to the Department of Health, there would be a number of you know, national forums that we might sit on where there may be a Department of Health representative present, but they typically aren't somebody in a decision-making capacity. So there is a huge remove between our relationship with the Department of Health. Sorry, Sorry uh, just Mo and then, and then yourself. Yeah. I, I think it would be fair to say that uh, I think what it reflects is the fact that there is no policy and there's no strategy. Um, and with, you know, clearly... Um, what existed in the past in terms of and was recognised indeed in the 80s and 90s on the key role of the voluntary sector which led to the formation of the Enhancing the Partnership Agreement which you know may have had its pros and cons but it certainly underpinned the relationship between the state and the Department of Health with the voluntary sector and the disability sector for many years and did so very effectively for many years. Um, I think that was basically lost during uh, uh, from 2009 onwards and I think what we see today is the uh, reflection of there being no strategy and being no policy that determines what that relationship should be so it tends to be rather ad hoc and uh, results in uh, many of the issues that relate to the sector not really being brought forward or addressed. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Louise, at the earlier part of your opening, um, you mentioned trading recklessly um, and the experience of many of the members of the National Federation of Service Providers, uh, Voluntary Service Providers, is emphasis of matter is noted in their annual financial statements. Conversations are being had at boards now about going concern and trading recklessly. My own organisation has a 101 million turnover. Mm -hmm. We have a 7.2 million accumulated deficit. We have an in-year 3.2 million operating deficit. So there was a very serious discussion at our board around going concern and trading recklessly if that becomes the reality in 2019. Um, forwarding cash to manage that deficit um, within the year um, happens on a month-by-month -month, uh, basis on a drip feed and added to Rosemary's remarks, uh, in, add into that the 20% the cut when you don't sign a service arrangement as a board member that clearly says you can't operate with the allocation that's being received. That is the lived reality of our members mm -hmm. um, and there are 59 of them totalling 1.3 billion um, across the state of Ireland um, and we don't think it is is um, possible to sustain this any further? Okay, uh, 
Um, thanks very much. And the, just one very, very brief and final question. This is for Catherine. Uh, Miss Day. Just with regard to the, um, the involvement of faith-based organisations in uh, healthcare delivery, um, we could get into the, the, the rights and wrongs, but we'd be here all day. Uh, but just you, you say it's going it, at the moment. It's 14 hospitals. Um, obviously, there's, there's people who would say that that's 14 too many. But your expectation is that it will go to four. Have you a, a timeline for that? And can you give us an indication of, of where and how you think that that's going to happen? Is there a specific plan in place with a timeline, or is that more uh, a sense that you get? Um, well, first of all, there are 14 voluntary hospitals, of which we concluded 12 are faith-based. Now, some of them would contest that. Um, for example, the National Maternity Hospital has a board of 100, which is, according to its charter, chaired by the Archbishop of Dublin, but he has never chaired a meeting. Mm -hmm. For us, technically, that still constitutes oh, faith-based involvement, but in reality, it has already moved away from that. Um, and there are, um, these are all uh, individual decisions of the faith-based organisations. Yeah. Just, just on that, he hasn't chaired a meeting, but no. he could. He, he doesn't uh, attend and chair. But he so could. The, in, in, um, the, the is... On paper, yeah. there is an involvement, but in practice, there isn't. Um, so we need to make nuances between um, the, the different state of the 12. But what's happening in most of the faith-based organisations, but not all of them, they are withdrawing from membership of the board or even from ownership or from the right to nominate directors on the board. Mm -hmm. And uh, our best estimate, and, and we can't say that when the time exactly what, how many years it will take but I would say relatively quickly because of decisions that we know are underway in some of the faith-based organizations um, our best estimate is that we would be very let's say in three to five years time down to four hospitals with faith-based okay and do you know who those which, which hospitals they are would you um, be comfortable telling us? Yeah, um, St John's in Limerick yeah, yeah. Um, just the hospitals, won't they? Yeah, yeah like just the hospitals. hospitals. Yeah. Um, we, we'll try and find that out and tell you. I, I just can't remember yeah, offhand. Sorry. Okay. No, that's fine. We can we can we can come back to that if that's a, if that's not readily available. Okay. Well, in the interest of letting other members in, we can come back to that at, a, at another stage um, before we finish. And I'm going to call on uh, Deputy Stephen Donnelly, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you all very much for uh, attending. But I think far more importantly for all of the work that you, uh, you do to the voluntary sector and indeed to the independent review group for the report. Uh, it's, um, it makes for very sobering reading and your opening statements make for very sobering listening for a wide variety of reasons from service provision to financial stresses and strains to future stresses and strains and, and, uh, and what is described as a broken relationship uh, between the voluntary sector and, uh, and the state. So all, all very sobering stuff. Uh, can I start with the voluntary organisations first? The, the, the review group, the report was published in February. So it's 100 pages. It makes uh, 24 recommendations, um, very sensible recommendations. Some of them technical, good governance, some of them quite profound in how they would, how they would change the, 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 the relationship. Um, can I ask the voluntary sector, have you seen any progress from uh, the state on any of those uh, 24 recommendations? Have you been engaged with in a meaningful way on any of those 24 recommendations? And uh, on the ongoing reconfiguration of the health service, which you are an integral part of, there is a massive reorganisation going on now. How closely have you been consulted and involved in the uh, plans which are going to appear uh, before Cabinet quite soon? But the simple answer to that, Stephen, is no. And there's nothing to expand on because certainly for our organisations there has been no engagement either in terms of the recommendations in the report or indeed the future development of strategy. So there's not much more to say because there just isn't anything to say. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> okay. I don't and, know if anybody else has anything to add, but yeah. No, no. There's been no engagement. I, I think it would be fair to say that we, when we published the Who Cares report, asked to meet with uh, Laura McGahey in the Sludge Care Office, and she did meet with us. But that has been the absolute extent 
of, of the engagement. And I, and I do think we all identified clearly when the Slaunch Care Report was issued. I think uh, it initially identified that the voluntary sector was not a key part of the future plans. And it also, I think, the, the relative uh, importance it gave to disability, I think, was no more than a couple of lines. And I think that, to us, reflected our status uh, within the future thinking. And yet, we really are intrinsic to a policy that looks to see our health and social care services delivered from a community uh, perspective, yet without us providing the many home supports, um, residential or day services and all of those supports, uh, many of those uh, opportunities to deliver uh, alternatives to uh, acute delivery uh, won't, be, won't be happening. And for many of us, uh, you know, we have an increasingly ageing population within our de demographic and uh, we see their needs yeah. not being reflected and yet we see many proposals indeed for the funds that Staunch Care were looking at, very geared towards uh, opportunities for older people, but not older people with disabilities. Uh, so we really are not part of the consideration. Okay. Yeah. The work, uh, the Health Service Capacity Review, which was published last year, yeah. did not comprehend disability and said it explicitly excluded it. Yeah. So there's been no forecasting to 2031 yeah. as there has been for the acute care sector yeah. for disability services. Okay. And the Workforce Planning Report of the Department of Health, also published 2017 into 2018, equally has failed to comprehend disability social care from a workforce planning perspective. And I think that's quite significant. So just to recap, disability and social care explicitly excluded from thinking about the future. Uh, a quote from yourself, Ms. Flynn, no policy, no strategy, uh, a broken relationship, and even though we have an excellent report published about five months ago, there has been zero engagement in that and zero engagement in, in the, the, the forthcoming changes to the healthcare system. I, I guess we are, th th that is the most damning testimony we have of the reality of this broken relationship. It's quite mm -hmm. extraordinary. Um, Ms. Day, can I ask you, because it, the, the broken relationship is, uh, it, it, it is, a, is a phrase you used, and, and clearly it goes to the heart of, of, of the, the, the problem here. C can I ask you why it's so broken? Like what we're hearing now is not a mildly dysfunctional relationship. What we're hearing now is a multi-billion euro essential service, essentially being kept completely at arm's length by the state, in spite of 3.3 billion euro of, of, of public money going into it. Do, do you have a sense for why it's so profoundly broken, and, and just as importantly, what we can do, not in the coming years, but in the coming months, to try and start bringing these groups together? There's, there's that question. And, and can I ask you just, just as well, how much strategic alignment did you see in your work between the stated health goals of the state and the spend on the 3.3 billion? And one of the things, I, I can't remember who, who, who said it, but it was around, oh yeah, it was, it was in the report. One of the recommendations was that there is a mapping of services provided. Is it the case that the HSE couldn't tell us today what they're getting? or even what they think they're getting for our 3.3 billion euro? Um, well, first of all, there, there's always many reasons, and they build up over many years as to why you arrive at a complicated situation. It's dangerous to simplify, but I, I will nonetheless. Um, I think that there, there, has, there is not a good understanding of the value of the positive contribution of the voluntary sector. Um, that which was very present in Ireland for a long time has, has evaporated. And um, then the financial crisis and the need to cut back, um, I think, was interpreted um, not in a partnership way, but in a command and control was the wording often used to us uh, way by the HSE. Um, and unfortunately, uh, we found that almost the whole emphasis had shifted to the financial side and rather the, the quality and um, range of services that were made available to the service users tended to get squeezed out in the process. Now, um, that's why we make the recommendation that there should be a new start. Um, there was also, um, I think in some parts of the HSE, a tendency to amalgamate 
the voluntary sector with the public sector. And that's why we say the um, le separate legal status of voluntary organisations should be respected, um, that their, their permission is needed to uh, involve them rather than to presume that certain services will be made available. So um, it's for all these reasons, and, and having looked at how, how do, has this happened in other EU countries, because most of them have a similar background to us of having had um, a, a voluntary um, health and social care services provided partly from faith-based organisations, partly philanthropically. Um, but I think that un, unless there is um, a new respect for the role and the nature and the difference of the voluntary sector, then it would be very hard to fix this problem. And um, perhaps there is an opportunity now with the change, um, um, a new CEO in the HSE, also a new HSE board, which was not there for most of this period. Um, and we hope that our report um, will make a contribution to that. What we would like is um, uh, for the forum uh, that we recommend to be convened fairly quickly so that our ideas could be discussed. Um, they may not be the best ideas in the end of the day. We, feel, we felt that in the voluntary organisations and in the HSE, there's a lot of people with very good ideas about how, <clears throat> how things could be improved. <clears throat> but those voices don't seem to be getting through. And the idea of the forum would be where um, they could meet and hammer out ways because um, everybody understands that public money is limited and has to be um, spent wisely. And the voluntary organisations came across to us as being fully cognisant of the fact that they have to be accountable for public money. But that within that, um, a lot of things could be done better. And it, there is a need for um, a kind of change in attitude and culture. And we would hope that the changes at the very top of the HSE are the opportunity and the moment to bring that about. Thanks. And if I could just say, I mean, having, having been at the head of the European Commission, um, a lot of um, uh, what we, we heard in this discussion reminded me of where the Commission had to change its attitude from one of arrogance to one of consultation and involvement. And it was a difficult process, but I think it was because at the top level, people understood that it wasn't possible to continue with the old way, um, that the message came very strongly that a change in attitude was needed. And I think okay. that's par part of our message. But we really think it's important that there be the engagement and the involvement for the future. I think perhaps Jane yeah. would like to... Yes, I, I, think, I think very key to, to our, our thinking on this is that there has to be mutual recognition that the voluntary sector, the 3.3 billion, is an integral part of the way we deliver services in this country. And therefore, the, 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 the involvement of the voluntary sector in the development of policies and strategies is absolutely critical. They're not out there. They are an integral part of the system. And I think we were very taken by the fact that this can work very well. You can get the strengths of the voluntary sector in other countries. It, it isn't the case that you have to say, well, the state should take over everything. You lose a lot by, by going down that route. And it can work elsewhere, and we can make it work here, I think. Thank you. And then to the second question, which is the strategic alignment. So the state, via the HSE, is paying out a huge amount of money, 3.3 billion euro. Um, and it sounds like it needs to increase for a wide variety of reasons. Um, how well lined up is that to a clear strategic um, position of the state in terms of the HSE service delivery plan, overall objectives, and so forth? How lined up is, is, is the money to what the HSE needs? And, and am I right in thinking, I may, I may have misunderstood, but am I right in, in thinking that if one of your recommendations is, is that the HSE needs to actually create a list of all the services it's currently paying for, that it doesn't actually have that right now. I, I think I'd like to slightly explain what we meant. Um, I think the HSE does know what it gets for the money that okay. it pays. Um, our point was that there's no forward looking at the services needed by the population, mm. and our population is forecast to grow by a million in the next, in the coming 20 or 30 years. So um, rather than starting with how much money do we have and how much can we spend and what did we spend previously, <laughs> we need to look at the population, including the increase in population, and try to come up with an idea of what, what do those people need and what services should the state take an obligation to provide? 
and again to oversimplify but in in some of the continental countries they involve the voluntary sector with the equivalent of the HSE mm. um, and they work out together okay to take care of these vulnerable parts of our society yeah. we need the following services now then you can have a debate about how much of those services will be funded by the public purse and are there other services that would be provided by voluntary fundraising or yeah. whatever and in times of um, budgetary cutbacks, perhaps the list publicly funded would have to shrink. But at least then there would be um, a clarity on what services were needed, what services were to be funded, and how they were to be funded. And that would give much more certainty to the, the families and the sure. parents and the service users. Um, but it, it, there needs to be that mapping regionally okay. in populations, So it's a planning to exercise. To link into, yes. Plan, plan yeah. so final, final question then is, is about the future health of the voluntary organisations. Um, so I've done work with NGOs here and in America and in the UK. And one of the, the differences I see here is that, that a lot of the voluntary organisations are very, very small. Um, about 10, 15 years ago in London, there was a big effort to consolidate and reach scale. And it was a painful process, but actually it led to better outcomes for the, for the service users in the end, because there was, a, there was an ability to, to have economies of scale and bring more expertise in and do a bunch of things that the really small organisations just find it very difficult to do. My first question, really for the voluntary sector yourselves, is, is that something you see here that, it, that it's okay, or do you think there, there, there is a good opportunity to consolidate and try and create, I guess, a smaller number of bigger organizations? That, that's the first question. The second question really is on the, the, the pension and pension issue. And I, I know Deputy O'Reilly's talked about the deficit, but the, the pension funding issue is something that can, can destroy even the, the, the wealthiest of organizations. Am I right in thinking that what you've said is that the state is now saying, while we may fund your, some of your capital and some of your wages and associated costs, the future pension contributions for your staff, you're going to have to find the money for them yourselves and put aside whatever it is, 5, 10, 15 percent per year into pension funds for your staff, and you need to go and raise the money yourselves to to find that. I'll, I'll clarify that point first, Stephen, if, if that's okay. So historically, our organisations have always been aligned to HSC pay scales. So if pay went up across public sector pay, our funding went up accordingly. If it came down, it came down accordingly. Yeah. What's happened in the current round of pay restoration is that we've been told for the pay restoration element of pay, there will be no funding for pension. We do, however, already have funding that covers the pension element of existing pay. And to give you an example of but that... But not for future pay rises. No, so not for future pay rises, yes. So one yes, of your staff, yeah. for example, uh, in four years' time, uh, gets a thousand euro a year. A year, yeah, four, yeah, yeah. Four thousand euro. Yeah. Or, or, or so we now have to pay the pension element on that thousand so euro ourselves. So you've got to go out and fundraise. Yes to deal with the pension liability associated with any Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to give you maybe a concrete example of that, one of our member organisations within the not-for-profit association would have a very high take-up in their pension scheme. And this will be, you know, exacerbated next year when there's mandatory sign-up for pensions. But this particular organisation have calculated that the impact of having to pay that pension on the €1,000 a year pay increase for each of their employees will effectively double their deficit for this year. So they're now in a position while well, they've been given the first tranche of funding to make pay the, the pay restoration, they can't do it because they can't pay the pension element to yeah. go along with it. So they're now in a situation with the unions to try and resolve that. Thank you. Just, uh, if, if it helps, yeah. just uh, literally my finance director just advised me the cost for us will be 435,000 over till 2021, just on the pay restoration yeah. element uh, that we will have to find additionally. Acquisitions, yeah. uh, part of your question, Stephen. Okay, I think there are um, uh, already examples of organisations that have uh, merged and formed alliances with each other or where, where one has taken the other over, um, partly driven by um, decisions between those organisations themselves that this was in the best interest of the future of services. 
for financial reasons or governance reasons or, or whatever it might be. So I think there are some examples uh, of it. And I, I know from our own membership there is certainly an openness to exploring those options, but there's also questions about it. Sure. Um, and part of those questions are around some of the underlying assumptions of what mergers and acquisitions will actually achieve um, and the importance of the relationship of organisations to the communities that they're part of and trying to, to maintain the right balance of scale. How do you maintain your connection to the community that you're part of and doing that well and at the same time doing it at a level of of um, size that gives you the type of efficiencies that you're talking about. But again, to get involved in those exercises, comes they come with costs as well. Um, and you know they may be time bound, but there are transition costs and there does need to be some resourcing. And, and, and again, I suppose if, if those kinds of things are to happen in a serious way, the role of the state in facilitating them could be really important. So that rather than two organizations inventing the wheel and then two others inventing the same wheel, the sharing of learning around process and so on could be usefully facilitated by the state in, in some of that. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Deputy Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wel welcome everyone uh, today, and I'm delighted we're talking about this. I've been raising a lot of questions in this area for some time. Um, in fact, recently, I don't know how many weeks ago, I raised this in the doll with Finian McGrath, and he accused me of frightening people, potentially. Well, I think what we're hearing today justifies why I raised it. I've also asked a number of specific parliamentary questions. I, I won't embarrass him by referencing the fact that there was no information out of him, um, and we got in the first five minutes today um, an example of the real problems we have here today. I think, I think the issues in this sector are coming to a head, thanks to the report that's done. I believe this is a crisis. I think it's one of the biggest crises facing healthcare in the country. Um, we have a situation where effectively the services here, I know the phrase uh, that was being used was that you were providing ancillary services. You're not providing ancillary services, you're providing essential services. There's a young man in Watford who I've been fighting for for two years to get full-time residential care, which hasn't happened because there are no services to be found for him. It's a crisis for his family. There is some funding available to provide services because the package is probably up to a quarter of a million that would be required for him. It's just one example. When you break it down to individuals and how individuals are affected by this, that's what's in my head, the image of uh, that young man. Um, I want to ask some very, I suppose, specific questions because ultimately here, this committee has been watched in great detail now by the Department of Health, by the HSE. Hi, guys. <laughs> because you need to start paying attention to what's happening in here. Um, because what's gone on before, and by the way, some of the people in the HSE in particular are very good people. They're excellent people. And in fact, off the record, they'll tell you they know this can't go on. I know that. Why? Because they tell me the same thing. And this has to come to a head. And hopefully today will facilitate it coming to a head. Um, uh, because uh, we can't go on the way we are. Um, I want to ask some specific questions regarding the deficits. How much is the total deficit? And I know this is guesstimates to a point, but how much do you reckon the total deficit is in this sector at this moment in time? Deficit and funding for current service, just, just at this moment in time, drawing a line in June 2019. I've heard the figure of 30 million. Would that be accurate? I think um, between the two umbrella organisations that we represent today, it is 30 million. But there are organisations that sit outside of our umbrella, so we cannot speak for them. So it's more than 30 million. Yeah, I'd say it's in excess of that because I. Okay, I Okay. It's always difficult to, uh, and, and this is part of the problem, I think, in terms of, of the need to actually do some work to get an accurate figure on this. Um, certainly for our own members, we would know that for 20, based on 2017 accounts, uh, the figure would have been 25 million um, for, tw for 2017. We don't know yet what it is for 2018 because accounts are still being, being filed. 
but what, what we also need to look at is what's been accumulated in previous years that become part of that. I, I, I would suggest that they're probably um, lower amounts. I think it's a worsening situation, um, certainly in, in what we've been looking at in terms of our own members. We've seen the situation grow worse. So year within year. your own remit here of your organisations, as regards current deficit, historical deficit, at this moment, in well, to 20, in the 2017, we're talking about 30 million, at least. At least, at least, and probably higher. Yeah. Okay. So that that gives a scale of the issue we're dealing with here, and that isn't. I mean, obviously there are organisations outside that, so you can obviously top that up by X million as well on top of yeah. it. So would it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that in 2019, as we sit here, that the historical and current funding deficit is somewhere around 40 million. At least, yeah. okay. I think that's something that needs to be out there. Um, other issue here is there's a handoff approach from the Department of Health. That's obvious. Um, so this is outsourced to the HSE, who then work with yourselves and outsource to uh, all the organisations. I want to focus in on you've got a, an equation here, a pendulum, a seesaw of, and you've outlined it. In detail of how you have to balance corporate governance, company law, potentially trading recklessly versus basically moral issues of on the one side and on the other side is the dependency on all the, us on all the users and service providers. And that's, that's a very, very difficult position to be in. But in my view, because of the way this has been constructed and the construct here and the facilitation by the HSE, it is a process whereby from the Department of Health as the parent down to the HSE, because the Department of Health are aware of this, into the HSE, down to yourselves. It is a process by which the HSE are effectively facilitating the potential of reckless training in some cases. Because, I mean, <coughs> The dichotomy here is, on one side, you've got to behave in a certain manner. On the other side, there's no way in which we want services to be taken away. And that is an, in in it's an impossible situation for all of these organisations to be left in. All of these organisations. And to continue on that, that uh, and that's not your fault, but I know where the fingers of blame would be pointed if there was any issues. It wouldn't be the Department of Health or the HSE, it would be to yourselves. And that's not right. So I want to focus in a little bit on, here on, on the process that happens each year. Um, I was wondering if we could get a copy of the letter uh, that was sent to the Irish Wheelchair Association saying they were going to cut to 20%. And I was wondering if you could actually do a scan around all the organisations over the last three years and find as many of them letters as you can and send them into the committee. Would that be okay? Because I think it would be good to get a scale of what is going on here. I'm sure the Department of Health are delighted with me asking for those, but anyway, um, so let's let's get to that. Let's let's tease this out a bit. So, and if I'm wrong here, just stop me. Each year, the basically negotiations start in relation to the provision, the contract, etc. I'd actually stop you there. Um, okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> there is no negotiation. Um, I think, as as Catherine rightly pointed out. When she described the process, an email comes out with a service arrangement template, and here's the number that was in it last year, so here's the number that's in it this year, or maybe a smaller number. That's the negotiation. Okay, that's very okay. good. So, yeah. the fait accompli comes out mm. in a written format, and you're told to sign it by X date. Mm -hmm. um, there's no negotiation, they don't tolerate negotiation. Is that the way it is? Um, certainly for my own organisation, we would we always have what we call a protracted negotiation led by us, which we're still in, because we have refused to show no deficits mm -hmm. within our service arrangements, which we've done for the last three years. And like rehab, we also um, evoked the dispute resolution process successfully, <coughs> and we'll be doing it again in the coming days if this isn't resolved. So we would have a little bit of back and forward, but it never changes anything. Okay. So every year, and this is consistent with all your experiences. Just make one quick point, Alan. I, 
Okay, I don't think it's the experience exactly the same in every CHO. So when okay, you say fair enough, HSE, fair point. I think there can be and some I think that's, variations. I think that's as a good well. quali yeah. qualification, to be fair. Okay, so then if you don't sign it, you get a 20% cut. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? And then in that scenario, obviously, service provision is hit and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You dip into your overdraft and you start paying charges earlier in the year. Okay. So. Because just to be clear, we make every effort to protect service provision and not eliminate perfect. and reduce Perfect. And rightly so. Okay. So in other words, the deficit grows and we get hit to this 40 million that we have. Okay. okay. Fine. That's, that's correct. So let me get into then how the HSC then helps with cash flow and loans. So Bernard, you might talk me through what happens as regards how the HSE then facilitate organisations with loans. Because for me, this is incredible stuff and will validate what I was saying earlier on. So basically what, what happens in, uh, for some organisations when they're running out of uh, uh, cash and as part of their engagement uh, process with the HSE, the HSE will advance cash. Uh, to them. Um, so at the early parts of a, a financial year, that's effectively, so for example, if, if, if we were being advanced cash this month, it's coming off maybe our December payment. So it's all within, to a point it's within year. But of course, by the time you reach the end of the year, nothing really has changed because your underlying financial position is still challenged. So you're now effectively have a loan from the HSE which has to be repaid to them. So you're beginning the following year with, let's say it's 500,000, well, the number doesn't matter. But just, no, but the numbers that, that, actually do that, matter because for the public watching, yeah. right? Yeah, because it's, it's this, reality, this is your forum to, yeah, yeah. what scale of loans are we talking about? Okay, that, that I don't know. I, I, I know, but it's, we're, we're talking something very significant. Are we talking in the millions in some cases? Oh, absolutely, yes, yes. absolutely. Yes. The public aren't aware of this, Chair, so it's just that, that sort of information gets across the scale of this issue. Go on. So then you, as, as part of your, your you, you reach the end of the year, you're effectively uh, um, have a loan from the HSE that now needs to be uh, uh, repaid. And your conversation with the HSE as part of your service agreement for the following year is about how that's going to get repaid. But the underlying issues are still there. So effectively, you could again be in a position that year where you're again getting cash advances and, and the, the position can accumulate and worsen unless unless something happens in the year. So it's just getting worse services here, yeah. or cost containment or whatever the, the strategy is, but potentially the situation could get worse. If the situation doesn't get worse, you owe money back to the HSE. So if you've, if you've exhausted your deficit in the bank, or your overdraft facility in the bank, you owe that back. And you now effectively also have an overdraft facility from the HSE and you owe them as well. And that loan from the HSE, is that a loan based on is that a continuation of the funding they give you, or is it a loan with interest? It's, no well, interest. There's no interest. Okay, so it's just, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that, so yeah. it's just yeah. a straight loan. So, yeah, sorry, that's a very good point. Could you maybe just explain that? Is, it, is that in terms of borrowing from next year's money? Yeah, so that you're, you're, yeah. So you're constantly... In, so it's just a rollover. Yeah, yeah. So, so our members' yeah. experiences in January, they draw a large lump sum down in the millions to clear their deficit in their or their overdraft in their account and to repay the HSE and then the money they have to operate the services. So it's called cash acceleration. And um, <laughs> that's, that, that, that is what it is called. And um, we have members in the National Federation who have had cash accelerated to them to manage in January of this year, such as the size and scale of their... In January? In January of this year. So they're already hitting the problem we, in January. We have members who are in April of this year had to have cash accelerated to them to avoid dipping into their overdraft facilities which incur penalties and extra charges. So when I ask parliamentary questions to the Minister regarding loans, regarding deficits, uh, they weren't able to tell us. 
I think it would be helpful. Uh, and I'd not I, you know, I'm, not, I'm no expert on the financial situation of other organisations. However, there are a number of large public sector or voluntary organisations that if you looked at their published accounts and you can see very clearly within those that there are both going concern uh, conditions uh, put in by their auditors and also very clearly um, the indication of how much money the HSE has had to advance that organisation in terms of functioning. And that would be some of the larger um, voluntary organisations. It's very clear within their published accounts that information. And again, just, just I think for balance and, and, and fairness, it's important to also just say that there have also been some instances um, where the HSE have made fun funding available to some organisations to try to, to yes. contribute something towards correcting their financial situation. It isn't just the loans. I, th I think where where so just there, there that, have so been some there have been some efforts. Whether I don't think they've been adequate, and they, they certainly um, haven't dealt with the with the overall uh, um, uh, situ situation for voluntary organisations in general. But I think it would be it's important to be fair to say there have been some efforts to try to make some. Okay. So the following is the picture. You, what happens is obviously there's a the significant deficit. Uh, the contract is sent, maybe some form of very minimal negotiation. Uh, the contract has to be signed. If not, there's a 20% cut. That means that organisations dip into their have to go and uh, fund it in a different way, and obviously it gets into a larger deficit. As a consequence uh, of that, some organisations are, as we've heard now, coming under increasing pressure and even in January are required to get advances from the HSC. The HSC are providing millions in loans uh, to uh, fund the gap that's left because of the fact that, they're fun that there's a funding deficit there in the first place as regards the equation versus um, actual service provision. And following on from that, as, as a consequence, um, then uh, there are some other examples whereby the HSE are putting in other funds uh, where organisations are in fear, very serious uh, um, situations to keep service provision. Mm -hmm. And following on from that, then basically the deficits keep growing year on year afterwards as a consequence of what I just said. And there's no end in sight. Well, they may or they may not, depending on the cost containment measures that the organisations Of course. Use. And I'm aware from very different organisations of cost containment when it comes to trimming down. I'm well aware of that, whether it, whether it comes to various different actions that have been taken as regards uh, cost containment. Okay, so that's the factual situation where we are. It's a disgrace. It is a crisis. And the public now know it because of the fact that we've come in here and ele elevated it and brought out the detail like this. And it can't continue. So when the Minister accused me of scaring people, this isn't scaring people, this is a fact. And we've got to continue with the service provision, elaborate the service provision, so that that young man that I talked about in Waterford can get a service, right? Um, but we can't continue the way we are at this moment in time. So let's bring it up to the next level. So the report that was done by Catherine, excellent report, needs full implementation, we know that. So when I asked the Minister, he said uh, himself and Minister Harris intend to establish a new dialogue forum between the department relevant organisations, blah, 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 and to, quote, strengthen the relationship. We've heard from you earlier on from questioning from a few of my colleagues here that effectively, since the report has happened, there has been zero dialogue. Is that accurate? So, since the report happened, and despite the Minister's assurances, we know now that the, from the Department of Health that there has been zero dialogue as regards dealing with this issue. Is that a fair reflection? Yes. So if the minister has said this, but it hasn't happened, and they're setting up this new form, which you probably haven't heard of yet. No, you've never heard of this new form. That's interesting. Um, and we now know the actual factual position as regards the scale of the crisis and how this is going to escalate year on year on year, and it's going to get worse. It would be fair to say at some point, at some point here, the top is going to explode of this because it's not sustainable. And what would be the consequence of that? Well, I think you saw that, um, Deputy, with the rehab care situation, which, you know, you're familiar with because it's so recent that our board, you know, found itself in a situation, the organisation found itself in a situation where it could not countenance what you described earlier of the, the effective conflict between the, the, the reckless trading piece on the one side and our, and our you know, 
commitment to delivering services on the other. And we were then forced to say publicly, as you know, that uh, the board had no option but to say that um, the service agreement would have to be terminated and give notice that the service agreement would have to be terminated to stay within the law, in effect. And, and to actually, you know, to, to highlight a situation where without more funding, and we were talking about €2 million, Euro, which in the context of the size of rehab care is small, but without it, we were going to be in a situation where we were, you know, effectively, <coughs> effectively ready for liquidation. So that's, 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 that's what happens. So, the cynical part of me um, uh, would think that uh, an organisation going to the wall and, and actually bringing this issue to a, a complete head um, is almost uh, not expected, but it's almost a requirement. For, for the for the sense of urgency that this needs, um, and I think there are organisations who are who are very close to that, uh, not because they 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 want to be, um, but, but they feel that they they have to be, and it's almost like, you know, does that need to happen before this is taken as seriously as it needs to be taken? I think you're right. I think it's a very accurate statement, and it very nearly happened. Um, um, so. The picture I painted in dialogue with yourselves is where we currently are, okay? Um, and obviously everyone around in this committee, the most important thing is service provision. And by the way, as I've outlined, the requirement for future service provision as well, which is high demand because like, when I talk about full-time residential care, I believe that, that specifically that area alone is like we're just... It's, it's a disgrace, it's embarrassing where, where, where we're leaving people. Um, so, how do we fix this? Right? I mean, we know the implementation of the report 100%. Okay? That's going to take a period of time if there was a commitment from government. But arising out of this as a first number of steps, right? because today is a shocking day. It's an embarrassment for the government. It's an embarrassment for the ministers. It's obvious that the commitments that they've made are not being honoured. It's obvious even what they've said in some cases are not being honoured. So as regards the first steps coming out of this to force the government into a kind of a, a direction, what are they? Thanks, Deputy Kelly. And if I could just ask, please keep your responses brief, because I know that there are others who have indicated they want to come in. And I've been very... Need to think the time. I would answer that in two parts. Um, firstly, a costing methodology for disability services has never been bottomed out in Ireland. Um, several uh, stop-start attempts have been made at it. Um, so until we actually understand how to cost disability services, we'll never reach that platform that's referenced in the independent re review group. So implementation of all aspects of the IRG recommendations is taken as read. But a costing methodology is, is very clearly intrinsically linked to the financial viability and the service provision aspect. There is a false assumption that the service provision in disability social care is static. Um, we are seeing an explosion in young people um, with very complex needs I agree, I see that survived myself. into adulthood in times past. I see that myself. Equally, at the far end of the spectrum, we are seeing um, men and women with disabilities who are older, who are surviving much longer than they would 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and we're also seeing an increase in population. Ireland, for the first time ever, has gone beyond 5.5 million since the famine. Um, so the Health Service Capacity Review a piece of work like that done for disability social care to map out and scope out the scale and extent of disability social care provision and to plan for it in the context of multi-annual budgets that are sensible is really what is required. Yeah. Can I also add, I think there's a point in relation to the service agreements and the service agreements um, and there was due to be a review of the service agreement part one that should have started last year and ironically because of the IRG report that was deferred until the outcome of the report was known um, but it's continuously being deferred still this year as, as recently as last week we were told the meeting wasn't happening that should have kicked off that process because the Department of Health and the HSE hadn't met yet to discuss the, the recommendations of the report so I think that would be a very useful step as well. 
Sorry, Wait, said, uh, Alan, there's a crisis. And it's, it's really welcome to hear that stated here today and that recognised by the members. But it needs to be recognised, as you've stated, you know, by the department, uh, in particular by the minister. And then actions need to be taken. The house is falling down as we speak right around us. Uh, you know, it's not going to get built up again unless action is taken. We've got a lot of recommendations, you know, we've got a lot of analysis, we've, we've put our figures in front of you. Uh, but it's urgent now that action be taken. So what we need is we need a commitment from the Minister, you know, and from the government, I would say, because the department that hasn't been mentioned much here today is deeper. Um, you know, and we, it, there was a reference to the change in the relationship from partnership to command and control. And was, you know, we have identified in our report that that change in culture has been driven very much by deeper. But it's obviously it's a governmental, it's a policy, it's a cultural issue, and that needs to change. But in the short term, there is a crisis. So first of all, recognise there's a crisis. You know, admit that there is a, a funding problem, because without the funding problem, without the funding problem issues, the house will fall down as we know. So let's get some scaffolding in place first. Thank I'll you. hold it up. Thanks very much. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, I thank our, our, our witnesses for, for uh, coming before the committee this morning and for giving us their, their respective reports. It makes for a very uh, uh, useful uh, starting point. I'm a little concerned about the direction because it, that, that we tend to go at some of these meetings because it would appear that um, the government seems to be in some way blocking or impeding progress in terms of delivering services to much needed services to a very vulnerable group in society. And I want to say it emphatically that is not the case. The Minister is fully conversant with the issues. But the issue that is arising now is a different one. And I have a number of questions about it. Uh, first of all, if we attempt to fund all the organisations in this country, and the country itself, by way of public acclamation, we will soon be back in 2008, only worse. And that's a, 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 an issue that we need to take on board and learn carefully and, and, and put it on, to one side and ask ourselves the next question. So the question there is, do we want to be back where we were in 2008, uh, nationally bankrupt? And the answer to that is we don't, because we won't get any salvation from any quarter the next time, it will be our own fault fundamentally and we will be left with it. So we need to keep that in mind. The next thing that comes into to, to my mind, I used to be a member of a health board, for, unfortunately for my sins, Madam Chairperson, for a very long time with them. Must have been a very big sinner at some stage. And the point that, that came, comes to my mind always is this. How do you see yourselves? Do you see yourselves as contracting to provide a service? And to whom are you contracting it? Are you contracting to the Department of Health, to the HSE, to both, or is there something in between? And, and I, would, I would like an answer to that question. We sign a service arrangement with the HSE. That's a contract. So it's a, an, on a contractual basis the services are being provided. And I agree. That's, that's, that's my understanding as well. To, to what degree does that entail uh, the Department of Health or the HSE providing uh, support for pensions or for other services? In, in, in my view, if one provides a contract, uh, pro contra contract to provide a service, it entails everything. You bring your baggage to the contract and you stand over, you, you provide everything yourself. I provide everything myself if I'm a contractor, just the same as a builder or somebody else. And to what degree have you found that it was necessary to call on either the, uh, your own voluntary fundraising activities or the, the HSE or the Department of Health to assist in relation to such issues as pension uh, provisions for the future? That's another question. To what degree have you looked at, and this has occurred in the UK, I know, the multiplicity of organisations that would appear to be engaged in what are very vital and sensitive services uh, in the same marketplace, competing with each other in some circumstances, certainly in respect of fundraising, of voluntary fundraising. How do you see yourselves uh, fitting in there? Do you see yourselves in a situation where maybe some degree of amalgamation uh, might be beneficial? Uh, for example, the HSE and certainly the health boards all attempted to provide services 
under respective headings uh, from within their own resources. And they provided, they had to provide for themselves. The other one is the voluntary sector. And uh, the voluntary sector consists of many and various uh, sectors and issues and compartments nowadays. And again, um, I would respect the, 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 the you know, the, the voluntary sector for what it does. It does a great deal of, 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 of work, and ex, you know, the religious part of that has been referred to on numerous occasions. You know, we as a country were quite happy to to, to accept the services uh, provided by all those sectors uh, in, in, in years gone by, and um, so. You know, we can't on the one hand say, well, by the way, we don't want you because you represent some religious group or something like that, but we would want the services that you previously provided. So from, our, from, from my particular viewpoint, I think we're being hypocritical in the way we look at some of those things. So my question there arises, you know, how, how do you see yourselves as the, the, the voluntary non-profit sector uh, fitting into uh, the rest of, the, of the, the fabric of services provided uh, by the, the HSE or by the Department of Health. Uh, you've had meetings with um, Laura McCahey, uh, and uh, how long did the meeting take place? Was it a satisfactory meeting? Uh, did it give, uh, did you or did she give you any indication of uh, future prospects in terms of, of, of uh, uh, interaction? And are you meeting again? And the next uh, one is um, the costs involved in the health services and providing health related services are growing all the time and will grow. Three billion is a lot of money. Uh, three billion is a, a, a heck of a lot of money, even out of the very extensive budget of, 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 of the, the, the Department of Health. The extent to which extension of the cost of the services is likely to continue in the future based on information to date what in your opinion is the likely outcome in terms of the necessary increase in taxation in order to fund it because that's the only way it can be funded the minister doesn't uh, stick his hand into a back pocket and find money or, 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 or refuse to find money he wants to help out the department of health wants to help and the minister wants to help for obvious reasons, for political reasons, for all kinds of reasons. So the presumption and the creation of the, of, of, of the, 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 the uh, belief that in some way the minister is opposed to providing the services that are necessary is totally and absolutely wrong. And, and, and uh, I think, you know, everybody has to look at, at how we present uh, the picture in that context, because if we don't do it, we're heading back to 2008. And if we want to go back to 2008 in terms of national finances, I think you know it might be a learning process. It might be a hard way to learn, but maybe it's necessary. Maybe the country does have to go broke again in order to uh, fully illustrate the seriousness of the situation we find ourselves in. My last point on this, and uh, Madam Chairperson, I've uh, restricted my, 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 my uh, submission so far, so I intend to come back again. My last point is this. Has any evaluation been done as to the extent of the increase in uh, income tax? That's the tax that all the people, the public outside here, pay on a weekly or monthly basis, as the case may be. I think it would be helpful. I think it would be beneficial if we were given some indication as to where we might have to go in the future. Because if we don't, on the one hand, we lose the services. On the other hand, if we don't pay for, if we don't pay for the services, we lose them. If we, if we don't provide the funding through taxation, it doesn't come from anywhere else. We don't provide the funding through taxation, then the services go as well. So we're, we're caught in a, in a cleft stick. So, uh, Madam Chairperson, I'd, uh, I'd be grateful for, uh, uh, and, and incidentally, I've had dealings, you'll be glad to know, with all of the voluntary organisations that are involved here, and many of the subsidiaries as well. So, and I'm I would absolutely delighted to know that, uh, um, Deputy Durkin, and perhaps you might, if you can, address some of the questions that were raised, and we take them in turn. Well, wait I, a second now, Chairperson. I, I know it's your intention to come back. It is my intention as to come said, back. Yes. That's right. That's good. I, and that's noted. I'm very happy to. Just on con the, the issue around contracting services, um, 
I think, yes, we are in what is ostensibly referred to as a contractual relationship with the HSE. Um, as an organisation that contracts with many other bodies, both within this jurisdiction and outside this jurisdiction, I think the essential difference in the relationship is that uh, in, in, other, in other contractual relationships, we are in a position where we can build in the costs related to running the service, related to employment, related to pensions and etc for our employees as well as being able to build in sufficient margin so that we can actually build and develop our services you know as not for profit organizations we're not putting our money back to shareholders we're putting our money back into the services our relationship as it is in terms of the contract with the HSE is essentially one as was described earlier where we're informed this is the amount of money you got last year this is the amount of money we're giving you this year. The room to be able to actually increase that so that you can drive a surplus that well, would actually sustain you yeah. into the future for all of those I, I, areas I, is not actually I there. hesitate to interrupt, but that really wasn't, uh, is not an answer to my question. My question, in a contracting situation, uh, the, 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 the reference to the terms on which the response comes from the person to whom we provide the contract of the organisation is not really relevant. The, the issue that's relevant is the extent of what we propose to provide under the contract and the cost to the person to whom we are making the contract. Yes, but if you can't build in the true cost, and the, I think this is the issue, is that where you're unable to actually describe the true cost of delivering those services. Well, one presumes that the true cost is, is determined by a, a, a specification as to what the contract is. Uh, there's e the, it, it's either a true cost or it's not a true cost. Well, I think so that's the, the, that's true the point. Cost arises. If, I think that's if, the point if, we're trying to if, say. If, is if that I advertise for somebody to contract to provide a particular service, and the details of that particular service, as required, presumably, is the uh, what the contract is going to entail, not in relation to some ancillary issues that might add on after. In actual fact, uh, in, in respect of government contracts, it is illegal to, to, to qualify a contract or to extend it uh, be, beyond its original remit. So my question still remains, you know, and this is a, a fundamental issue. If the contract is not uh, properly laid out by government or by the, the, the person offering or advertising the contract, or if, if not responded to properly by the organisations proposing to provide the contractual service, then we have a problem. We don't and know I, where I, we're going. I think, Deputy, I, I think if you um, had the opportunity to look at the service arrangement documentation itself, which contains many sub-schedules, all of which allow at various stages during the year for variations in the contract, um, as and when those are required, both by the HSC or where the organisation uh, arises. So it's not a case where a contract is assigned at the beginning of the year and that determines fully what the requirements well then, there is space Madam within Chair, it yes. to, uh, want, to, to, to change that. Emphatically, that is an unsatisfactory way to do a contractual business. The contract is initiated and driven by the HSC, so you need to bring that back to the HSC, Deputy Director. Well, I need to bring, bring it back to both parties, uh, Madam Chairperson, and, and, and to, to those providing the contract and seeking to have the contract provided. But because if we have a series of, of, of provisions and additions emerging throughout the year, then we're not going to be able to set down a precise cost in relation to a contract. It doesn't work that way. I make a broader comment, not representing any organisation, but we were asked first to do a factual assessment of the situation. And uh, what we quickly, the reason why we recommended mapping the services was we felt that there wasn't um, a good overall understanding of the services that were needed and what, what it really costs to provide them. And that's why in our report we brought up this question of the ballooning uh, deficit because it was being simply put to one side as though it didn't exist. Now, um, so that's why we recommended a mapping of the services because we need to know what, what is the extent of the services. And the state needs to say uh, how many of the services that are needed it is willing to, pr to, to provide for. And the state then has to decide does it provide for them through public 
public system or does it uh, contract out to the voluntary sector uh, because it feels there is a positive value um, in working with the, the voluntary sector. Now, the question of um, the large number of organisations came up and we looked at that as well. And we, we did not make a recommendation to consolidate um, because we felt that part of the extra that the voluntary service adds is, in lots of cases, proximity to the service users. And, um, but why we recommended that the state should have uh, a rolling list of services that it, it commits to fully fund is that then you would be able to be clear with people what services would be provided. We made the point, for example, that you could not prevent a group of concerned parents from setting up a voluntary organisation if they felt that they could help in some way. But they couldn't equally, they couldn't have an expectation that the state would fund whatever they decided was needed. That's why you need clarity in terms of what services are required by the population and how much of those services the state is prepared to provide. What it seemed to us in the negotiations with the HSE is, of course, we're not starting afresh. So we're coming from a historical situation. We're coming from a situation where, um, of course, the HSE wants to provide the services, but has a limited amount of public money. But it's starting from, instead of looking at what are the services that are needed, it and the organisations to a certain extent are looking at, well, we're here because we're here and we need to be funded to continue. And we felt that that was not a sustainable situation and what we needed was to be clear what services are to be provided, by whom, uh, and then the full cost has to be paid. Because what happens if the voluntary services throw back the keys, to use the expression that was used earlier? The state will have to step in and provide those services. And one needs to look at the cost of that and decide whether it's better value right. for the public purse to do it through the voluntary sector, right. taken in the round not only financially but also for the quality of the services that are offered, or is it not sustainable? Is there not the capacity in the voluntary sector to do it? In which case then provision has to be made in public budgeting for the public sector to provide it. And what we were trying to recommend in our report was that the, the factual basis needs to be established, so we suggested that the Department of Health and Deeper look at the deficit situation, put a figure on it, and then work out how is that deficit going to be absorbed or what services are going to be cut if that deficit can't be absorbed. So there's a need for greater clar clarity on the factual situation and then a strategic discussion about what services are to be provided and by whom. And, and, before, bef and that has to happen before you can put a cost on it, I think, Deputy. I, I agree you. entirely, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Deputy Dorkin. Uh, Senator Dolan. Well, I mean, there are a couple of other questions to be answered yet. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I don't want to be the shortest contributor in the course of the meeting which started um, well, at uh, 9 o'clock this morning. Deputy, <coughs> can I assure yes, you are, I'm keeping a very close eye on the time? I'm okay? keeping a very and, and closer eye on the time. I'll sure you get all of the time that you need. Can you answer the questions, as I said, the last question asked by Deputy Kelly as briefly as you can, because I'm conscious that there are other people who've indicated. Thank you. Uh, maybe just a couple. Maybe so, lots of people. Never Deputy Dorkin, but <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, I was one, referring hopefully to, one have to be. Sorry, sorry, I'll just be clear. I was referring <coughs> to the point I had made to you with your last question, Deputy joke. Kelly. Sorry. Just to be brief. Sorry. Uh, 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 just maybe to, to, to respond to a, a couple of the, the questions that you raised. Um, in relation to the, the um, what would be the cost to the taxpayer in terms of um, a, a responding to the need, I, I, okay, I can't comment on what, what a percentage uh, uh, impact might be. But what, I, what I can say to you is that okay, the HSE undertook a, a piece of work as part of a um, review of future service need uh, in 2017, um, and uh, it produced a report that projected a, an additional investment of 200 million euro per annum for a five-year period was needed based on costs at that time to meet known and future need as it was known at the time. I, my understanding is that that's been updated by the Department of Health at the moment, and they're looking at a 10-year projection um, uh, to, to build on that. So, I th but I think that's the kind of of um, cost uh, and that you'd be looking at in terms of, of meeting future, current and future need. That doesn't include the types of issues that we're raising around um, uh, deficits or you know, de dealing with those things that, that are there, they would be on, on top of that. Uh, but that's the kind of scale of investment that we, we think is needed. And that's, that was a piece of work done by the, the HSE. I, I think part of the, the challenge in the work that we're involved in is that 
and it relates a little bit to the, the challenges around contracting for services. We're in support of people who um, travel along the whole life journey, and we can engage with the HSE today to agree a budget for the provision of a service to me. Um, but my needs can change quite significantly tomorrow, same as any of the, the rest of us here. What we don't have is a system of being able to renegotiate when those things happen. And they're real life situations, they're not, you know, we can't abandon people, we won't abandon people in those circumstances. But we do need a, an arrangement with the state that at the one hand allows the state to know it has a finite, finite resource, it has to manage within that resource, but we also need something that's flexible enough and adaptable enough for us to be able to engage properly around when those change in needs happen and, and, and to be able to respond to, to so, them in a, in a reasonable way. Yeah, and, and what, to, on an annual basis, an ongoing basis, can you envisage a situation whereby you can inform the state, the HSE or the Minister for Health, a, at the beginning of the year, that we will have add-on costs throughout the year arising from extra services that will have to be provided or extra cost of the services that are being provided and in what way. And I'm mindful of the fact that we cannot negotiate pay agreements uh, in this uh, or any similar forum yeah. because if we do then we should abdicate our various responsibilities and walk away and say listen we're, this thing is out of control and it can't be done and incidentally that was one of the things that was that was uh, uh, opined uh, by previous ministers yeah. over the years but uh, I, I, I think okay I, I think there's enough um, a information and experience between the, the HSE and the service provider community to be able to work together to have some kind of an estimate each year of what, what might typically arise in the course of this year um, that we don't necessarily know where it's going to arise but we could anticipate that there'll be a certain level of change in need over the course of, of, of the year. The, the other thing that I'd, I'd say in relation to um, some of the uh, deficit situation for organisations like ourselves um, in the past, and I, I do appreciate that it was in the past, when the HSE itself was running into financial difficulty, it was able to go back um, to the Oireachtas and get a supplementary allocation. We were never included in any of those uh, um, supplementary uh, uh, submissions. So, you know, our, our, our need, uh, particularly for, for uh, um, as voluntary providers, wasn't necessarily included in the ASK. And so when, the supplement required was, was much bigger than was uh, identified absolutely. at the time. Absolutely. So, so some of our, our historical deficits were might have been addressed at different times in different ways, but the, the, the system didn't allow for that. So it, it has, I suppose that's been a contributing factor and part of the frustration of, of how we're arriving at a, a position like, like uh, um, uh, today. You made a submission to Sláinte Care. Can I just no. to clarify that? Uh, when we published our report at the rehab group, we asked, uh, we requested a meeting with Laura McGay to discuss the report, to bring it to her attention, and to, you know, raise the issues around where we fit in the implementation of Sláinte Care. It was very much an information meeting. She was very interested in the report and the findings of the report, but it was that it was purely on behalf of the rehab group. It wasn't on behalf of a wider section, and there was no follow-up from that, uh, you know, and there wasn't any structure put in place to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, to pursue it further. It was very much about information, putting the issues on the, uh, you know, trying to put the issues on her agenda and bringing the findings of our report to her attention. And did you write to the committee that produced Slaunch Care in the course of its uh, hearings yes. and mm -hmm. deliberations? Yes. Yes. And uh, did you get a response, satisfactory response? No, we haven't got in front of them at any point. Or happened to, you, you didn't? Know, happened. Well, that's we concluded, that committee's concluded, obviously, yes, now. Yes, well, no, we didn't get ahead, we didn't get in front of them. Sorry, Shakespeare, you wanted yes. to, to respond there? It was just in the context of Laura McGann, we did meet with her, the, the Federation met with her, and she had 104 actions on the Sláinte Care implementation plan, uh, none of which related to disability, and she was very cognizant of that and recognised the fact that to throughout 2019 she needed to capture data so it would be built into the 2020 estimates that was her commitment to us when when we met with her but going back to your earlier points around costing we do have a national database that profiles for the most part um, 
individuals with intellectual disability, but less so for individuals with autism and physical and sensory disabilities. But certainly on, on preliminary review for the period 2010 to 2018, the country has seen a 35% increase in men and women with intellectual disabilities to the tune of 35% and an increase in age of people over the age of 65 by 240%. In the ordinary population, that constitutes increases in health, dementia care, and um, social care supports. So we have not done anything similarly for disability social care services, and that's something that the HSE, as I understand it, are looking at, and that the voluntary providers are committed to contributing to. Um, there is no equivalent to the acute care sector called the exotics or the unscheduled care budget within disability social care. So when these change needs represent themselves in somebody's um, daily functioning, um, we have no budgetary <coughs> capacity to meet those needs other than to overspend for the sake of safety. And I think they're really important things for this committee to, to, to be aware of today. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Dolan, who's next? Thank you. Um, and um, can I just begin by saying that thanks to all of the witnesses, and um, I, I think there's no doubt that the IRG, to kind of phrase, has done the state some service, and, and that will manifest itself. And the, the, I think the three of you uh, need to be thanked for that and the support you had in doing it. Um, my colleagues have made a number of very useful and interesting points, and we have excavated. Uh, a range of, of concerns and issues, to put it very mildly. Um, can I turn first to Catherine Day, if, if I like, the IRG and colleague. Um, is, this is a speculative question. Is, is the political system and our public bodies feeling threatened with a voluntary sector as an equal partner, as a conscience, as a critical friend? Um, and how might that broken down relationship be put back together? What's the one, two, three, or the, the key little pieces to that? Um, the idea of health as a resource for living and well-being, uh, and something that supports people to be out and about, not just being cared for in a health setting. And, and, and Bernard touched on this very, very clearly a few minutes ago. Is this being considered as a value for the, in, what I will call investment rather than cost, uh, that, that, that comes from the public purse? Or to put it in IR terms, could this be the productivity piece that, that brings us from uh, the, 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 the deficits and the underfunding? Uh, you talked about other EU countries that get this right. Um, just to get us Googling in the right place. What states might you be talking about, Mr and Mrs Google, our saviours? Um, the faith-based organisations, in effect, was one of the spurs for you to start your work. And it's interesting how it, it has moved uh, for that. And I'm just thinking about the, the, the Charity Status and Charity Act. Um, charitable purpose is a concept that goes back along hundreds and hundreds of years, way before we had a republic or a free state or anything. Uh, it comes from a very different worldview when kings were divinely um, appointed. It, and it does come from that time. And now we have the notion of public benefit. And uh, so, and, and I think the constitution sets out in a secular language and under, under rights uh, the, the, the connection between the old-fashioned term of charity or charitable and public benefit. And in, in fact, uh, one simple thing, the, the, uh, under the fundamental freedom section in the Constitution, the right for, and you touched on the point of a group of parents, yeah? the right of people to form associations and unions. Now, it doesn't give them a right to, to send in invoices. Yeah, that are going to be returned, paid in 30 days. That's understood. But is there, and uh, just your thought on the the, is that a way to bridge the 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 old traditional concept of faith-based or charitable purpose, uh, and that it can be seen in the can be seen as part of 
public benefit, public good. Um, now to co come down to more testing things, if you like, or immediate. The new head of the HSE, who was in here with us very smartly after he was appointed and brought with him a letter that he wrote on the 14th of June. And what would have interested us in that letter was uh, two things. Number one, I hold the line absolutely on the budget that I have been given. We know the, we know the footnote to that is that every year we've seen that budget broken and the state having to come in with supplementary estimates. And now the, the, the idea that that can't or won't happen, can happen, but that it won't happen. And allied to that, stating that we have to earn, uh, very interesting, the HSE has to earn the trust and confidence of its funders. And the point I put to the chief exec or the director that day was, so people who are not getting services, whether it's disability, elderly, I don't care, have to wait until a public body earns the trust and the confidence of another public body. Um, that is, I don't know what word to put on it, place, a really serious place that our public bodies have now found themselves in. For us and the people we want to serve, it well and truly leaves them out in the cold, and many of them. Um, we have the deficits and unmet uh, needs that are already there. Um, and then we have the, the, the Fiscal Council given us the financial weather forecast. Let's bring this in here as well, because uh, there's a lot of competition for public spending. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue of whether the base, the 60 billion, has to be looked at, or whether we just keep looking at the piece on the edge, which is extra or not extra funding. Um, the, just briefly to the organisations, and, and I suppose I'm somebody who, not in the past, but here and now, live on both sides of these tracks. I go to a board meeting of the Disability Federation of Ireland tomorrow that I'm the Chief Executive of. I then go to our AGM. We're dealing with a 20% deficit in our funding, as are others this year, because uh, of reductions that were made early this year by the HSE. I'm, I'm not moaning about that. I'm just simply, we all know. So I have that and I have this and, and being involved in the Shannon, which is a, a, a great privilege and honour and uh, a very, very valuable position to be in. The 38s, 39 ancillary and, and essential. And maybe Bernard would, would, would know this off by heart. I'm thinking of Ability West in Galway and I'm thinking of the Brothers of Charity in Galway. One is 38 and one is 39, and I would defy anybody to go down there and put the thickness of that paper between what either of them do. That is one of the great lies of all this. I'd ask people if they wish to comment on that. Um, recurrent narrative in the last couple of decades, the previous two decades, when I started my work in the Irish Wheelchair Association, uh, was when you met a minister or they came to open something and do whatever, they would say to you, and I'm paraphrasing, do you know what? When we get a few bob, we'll look after you. They got the few bob, and we know exactly where we are today. That something shifted. I'm going to say the, first 20, the, the previous 20 years and the more recent ones. And I think that's um, one of the conundrums we're in today. That the idea, the narrative now of too many organisations, inefficiencies, duplication, you're getting two billion, nearly two billion annually, and just talk about the disability side. And t turning to the committee, uh, I m would make this statement. We need to have, and have it fairly smartly, the analysis are the response of the three connected entities in the public space here, and namely Deeper, the Department of Health, and the HSE. Uh, we know 
deeper are always very busy elsewhere. But I can't see how they cannot, with, with, with any honour, refuse to be part of this conversation with this committee and elsewhere. Um, I'm sorry that my colleague Bernard isn't here, but some of the things he said I found confusing. Um, he did say, and I'm coming to a conclusion then, Cahirlach, I respect the voluntary sector for what it does. As a country, we were uh, happy to accept the services provided in the past and now. And I did feel, and I'm going to put this particularly to the voluntary organisations, as somebody who has grown up and lived in and has a great grow for the, for the role of voluntary participation in a republic. I find it hard to hear what Bernard said. This Bernard. Oh, no, not this Bernard, that Bernard. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Two Bernards. I find it hard Deputy to... Durkin. to <laughs> Deputy Dorkin. Deputy for the avoidance of doubt. Uh, the, the fear or the threat of being back in 2008 because the voluntary disability organisations would be getting a lot of funding. Um, that's how I, that's emotionally and instinctively how I heard that statement from Deputy Durkin. Uh, and I know he did make a different statement later on. I do not know how and I was deeply involved, I was on NESC at the time, and we did reports about this whole business and the cause of the crisis and all the rest of it, how that what happened then could happen again because voluntary organisations are standing up for the people they see uh, day in, day out. They don't see them in reports now. Let's be clear about this. These people are in front of them in front of them every day. I, I, I know you wish me to conclude. Thank you, Senator um, Yes, I, I, I know you, let me just say, and to be clear about uh, where I stand in relation to what I think is the instinct of our government. I was in New York last week at the, the conference of states parties in relation to the UN as one of Ireland's representatives there. Minister McGrath and officials were there as well. And this is what I said in the general debate. Ireland is serious about implementation and wants to make progress. I'm not here, I don't, my instinct is not that our state does not want to do the right thing. But I think we have to go about it in the right way. Thank you, Senator Dolan. Do our witnesses for response? Maybe I could answer three of the points and then I think others would want to come in as well. <clears throat> On the first point about whether <clears throat> the department and the, uh, excuse me, the HSE <clears throat> think that the, the, the critical friend of the voluntary sector is a threat in some way, I obviously can't speak for them, but let me take your question in a different way. Um, in our report, we say that one of the strengths and one of the positive contributions of the voluntary sector is their um, ability to advocate and champion and to be to say uncomfortable things and we felt that that's important in a democracy if you work in the public sector you're not free to criticize public policy um, and we, we we may i can't remember exactly the wording we use now but we did say that that role of ngos and of the voluntary sector in this particular case is necessary in order to keep challenging the system to deliver the best that it can deliver um, secondly, the other EU countries that we looked at, we looked at France, Germany, Portugal, Netherlands, among others, a little bit at Belgium, and there is a European observatory which gathers a lot of comparative data, which is very useful to look at how other European countries are doing it. I think we all know that there's no country on earth that doesn't have problems in its health se sector. Um, so we're not saying that everybody else has got it right and we don't. What we're saying is there are interesting things to learn from what others are doing. Um, and I think, I hope what comes through from our report is, yes, there are problems, but they are fixable. Um, and, and that should be the goal, is to find the way to put the parties together to, to fix them. Maybe make a, a, a two comments. Um, I think in, in relation to the point that you made in relation to the difference or the lack of difference between Section 38 and Section 39 organisations, I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, a, okay, 
I think you're right. You couldn't <coughs> slip a, a sheet of paper in uh, between the services that are being uh, provided <coughs> um, and the language that's used in the legislation and in the um, uh, subsequent contracts and so on to distinguish one as, as ancillary uh, while the other is essential makes no sense when they're exactly the same uh, services. And for me, it, it actually raises a very core issue about how we as a state and as a country look at all of our citizens and how do we judge them. So if we um, look at the services being provided by one organisation um, and we describe them as, as ancillary, and the, exactly the same service is an essential service for somebody else, we are saying something as a state to those people with disabilities about how the state is seeing them. Um, and, I, and I don't believe that that's how, how we think about it. I think we, we want to be treating everybody equally, but I think our legislation and our, our language undermine some of that. Uh, um, so then when you end up with differences in relation, for example, to how um, staff are being paid for doing the same job, depending on which organisation they happen to be employed by, it says something as well about the people that are in receipt of those supports and services. And I think we, we, we have to, to uh, be cognizant of that. I think in relation to your, your, your point in relation to um, a, going back to 2000, or the avoidance of going back to 2008, we as service providers are really conscious of how the economic downturn affected people with disabilities in Ireland. Uh, it affected all citizens, but I think we, we have to be mindful that for those people with disabilities, it had additional consequences. Um, so there is no way that we want to cause or participate in a process that um, brings the state backwards. Uh, it's, it's not what we're about. What I think is, is really important is, and, and for us today is about naming the issue. We, are, we know we have a stake in the resolution of this. Um, we made the point in our, in our opening statement that the IRG recommendations are challenging for everybody. It's not that just the state has to uh, do things. There are things in there that we will find challenging that will, will require us to consider how we're doing things and how we're using <coughs> our assets and all those uh, uh, kinds of things. And I, I, it, it behoves us to also say we have to commit to, if we're looking for the recommendations to be implemented, that means that we're committing to, to something as well. And it has to be to work jointly between ourselves and the state so we don't go back to 2008 and we don't get into this thing of it's only about throwing money at the, the problem. It can't just be about that. But equally, we can't say it isn't about some money. It, it needs to be as part of a strategy of things. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to make one point. You made reference to uh, potential for lack of trust between public bodies. And one of the issues that we highlighted in our report is that the vast majority of these voluntary organisations have to report to the company's office, to the charity's regulator, to HICWA and to the HSE, and probably a lot more besides. And in many cases, it's the same information that they are reporting multiple time over, probably on a slightly different form. And there needs to be much more uh, cooperation. And it's good to see that the charities regulator is looking at the Australian passport idea for Australia Char charities passport. And I think that would be very good because this is a cost issue because it has a cost on the state, all the state bodies to request the information, to process the information when they get it. But it's a cost on the voluntary sector as well. Thank you. <coughs> Senator Burke. Thank you very much, um, and thank you all for your presentations here today, and indeed for all of the work that you have done over many years to the voluntary organisations. Um, and I think the report is both reports are very are very welcome on this matter. Um, could I just start first of all in relation to increase in the health budget over the last four years, and there has been a substantial increase um, in the health budget. And I'm just wondering, has there been a comparable um, to what has gone into the HSC and what has gone to the voluntary sector? Because, you know, we are talking about 3.3 billion. I, I, I think that's nearly the same figure as what was there four years ago. So I'm just wondering, the comparable increase, has that been looked at? The second issue is in relation to staffing levels in the HSC in four years have increased by 13,000 additional staff. Uh, 2,700 of those are administration and management, which I have serious issues about. 
uh, whereas, say, for instance, public health nursing has only increased by 3.7 per cent, um, administration and management in the HSE has increased by 17 per cent. I don't believe that there's been a comparable increase in staffing levels in, in the voluntary sector. If anything, there probably has been uh, a greater demand on the voluntary sector uh, to produce uh, either do the same amount of work with less staff or else even do more work with, with less staff. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there's any comparable done in relation to the increases that have occurred in the public sector compared to the voluntary sector. The other issue that I want to raise is that <clears throat> there's a lack of understanding in Ireland in relation to the contribution of the voluntary sector and the organisations that are working there. For instance, I remember about five years ago, um, you know, going through the HEC annual report and seeing over two and a half thousand organisations getting funding, um, and you know, trying to explain that to the general public. And I'm just wondering whether the voluntary sector need to get um, more information out there in relation to, you know, the the, the kind of services that they are delivering, and how cost effective it, it actually is. Um, and I see it in particular in relation, and I know it's not, it's not a, a, the same comparable because in the, say in the nursing homes area, it's very much private sector, it's not voluntary sector. Um, I've seen, for instance, where uh, a nursing home, quite new nursing home, run by the HSE, is costing €1,600 Euros per bed per week, whereas a comparable uh, facility within three miles of it is getting €900 Euros per bed per week. Uh, uh, in uh, looking after the same um, kind of demands for, for patients. And likewise with the costings in relation to the voluntary sector, they're delivering, appear to be delivering a, a very effective um, a, a care uh, for a large number of people um, at a really um, efficient cost, uh, delivered very efficiently but not getting recognition for it. And I suppose the, the challenges that we now have, and you might like to comment as well, on the increasing demands, um, and I raised it in private uh, this morning about one aspect of the HSE where an entire section have resigned because of increasing, is increasing pressure from the general public as regards the service that they're requiring to be delivered, and an entire section of staff have resigned because they can't cope with the pressure being applied publicly. And this is because of a lot of adverse, and I'm putting my cards on the table, a lot, a lot of adverse commentary by media. For instance, if there's a voluntary organisation that runs into any kind of difficulty, mm. the media immediately seems to be focusing on that particular aspect of the organisation without looking at the overall picture about what the organisation is doing. And voluntary organisations are very prone, I think, uh, to adverse media coverage uh, unfairly, as far as I'm concerned. So I think, the, and I think what, um, what the report shows about the need for us all to work together, both the general public, both the voluntary organisations, the HSE and the department, and there is that disconnect that's happening. And the question now is, how do we go forward? It's not only about the HSC and the voluntary sector working together, but it's also about the general public, that you know, there's only so much any voluntary organisation can do, there's only so much any healthcare system can do, that you know, perfection can't be provided for every area. But I think we're now gone to a stage where people are looking for perfection that we can't deliver on. And I'm just looking for, you know, how do we work in um, and getting a message out there that everyone has a part to play and it's not just the people who are providing the service and who are working there, um, but the general public as well. Uh, and there are just some comments that I just want to make and I might come back on one or two others as well. Okay. Senator Burke. <clears throat> address some of them. Um, Senator Burke, I suppose the question that you raised about the public visibility of the services that voluntary organisations provide, I think you're right, it's not there, that people don't actually realise 
the depth and the breadth of the essential services that our organisations provide. And interestingly, up until, I think it was up until 2016, the Social Care Division of the HSE used to produce an annual report that would set out the funding that went to each organisation in quite detail, the types of services that were provided. Now, that wasn't necessarily, people aren't reading it up for bedtime reading, but it was available in, in the public domain. That report hasn't actually been published for the last two years, so there's really no visibility of the quantum, I think, of services that are provided. And I think we need to find a way to get that message out there publicly. We do it individually as organisations, but I think the HSE in its own annual report should be recognising the contribution of the voluntary sector, the types of services, the quantity of services that we provide for people. And just on your question with regard to headcount head increases, are they comparable within the voluntary sector to the HSE? Um, absolutely not, is the short answer to that. And that's compounded now, I suppose, because we have a pay disparity between the public sector and between the voluntary sector. All of our organisations are struggling at the moment in a full economy to both recruit staff and also retain staff. Because in my own organisation, we have a, a situation where we would be the largest provider of personal assistant hours in the country. We're finding it very, very difficult to recruit and retrain staff because people doing exactly the same job in the HSE are now getting full pay restoration. They're now also, in the last month or so, getting the benefit of pay for travel time, which our organisation can't provide. We can't compete. That is impacting our services. We are undelivering PA hours already this year, and that's only going to be compounded. And at the end of the day, it goes back to the people sitting in their homes, relying on those PA services, who are in complete isolation. They cannot get out of bed. They cannot get out of their house. They cannot participate and contribute in society. And it's really important that we hammer that out. Um, you, you asked about the increase in budget and whether that was matched between HSC and the voluntary service providers. So the HSC budget up uplift was 6% this year. Our members did not experience a similar uplift. Um, it's a little bit more complicated for the Section 38 agencies who use the pension-related deduction or the uh, uh, additional superannuation charge as it has been changed to this year as part of its operational income. So that kind of goes back a little bit to Deputy Durkin's <coughs> query around how are we funded. We're funded by using some of the pension levy income in addition to the allocation from the HSE. So the effect of that for some of our members is that they've had a negative increase in budget or a decrease in budget or a 1.16 increase or 1.6% increase in budget which doesn't match with the pay awards that we're expected to pay uh, and remain compliant with health sector pay policy. But I, I think it should be fair to say, though, that for Section 39 organisations, we haven't seen any uh, uh, similar increase in budgets. The only increases we see are specific to service areas. So an individual's care needs may have increased, and so we've negotiated an increase in the funding for that person. But it is very much related to particular services rather than the organisation as a whole. So uh, perhaps during the year, we've had... Uh, uh, you know, through uh, HICWA inspections, identification of increased service requirements, it's those that we would hope to get funded in the following year. In the year that they occur, we're expected to meet those costs ourselves. Uh, just to even give you an example, I, just one meeting I had with HICWA yesterday, I would say as a result of that, we probably have an additional between 60 and 80,000 cost on just one service for three people. Um, and that's just one out of 61 residential services that I have that just happened in one day. Um, so th these are continuous costs that go up that are not being actually met uh, and have to be negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis each year. The, there are provisions, obviously, within the HSE budget made for increased numbers of places or increased numbers of... Uh, multidisciplinary services like OT, etc. But uh, frequently, whilst they may be seen within HSE delivered services as increasing, they're very rarely translate out into those of us in Section 39 agencies. So, for instance, we buy in, we, we can't avail of psychology services, so we spend over 250,000 of our money each year buying in private psychology services to deliver to our service users because the HSE is unable to provide that through the public services for those people. As an example. Okay, but if you look at the, say, the budget four years ago and what was going to the voluntary sector 
as a percentage and you now look at what's going to the voluntary sector with the budget now, my understanding is that in real terms the budget of the voluntary sector has not increased, if at all possible. It's, it's taking a smaller share of the overall budget, yeah. that's why I'm yes, asking the question. Yes, it's a smaller share. And yeah. I'm just wondering if figures have been looked at from that point of view. Um, you know, the, the, the same level of service is being required by the voluntary organisations, but not as regards the, um, the overall increase in uh, that cost that you have in, in relation to, say, for instance, insurance, all the rest yes. of it. Uh, so y you haven't actually done a comparison of that. Just it's a, it would be interesting from our point of view um, to, to look at it. I think it would be an interesting yep. one to look at, um, because I would imagine that your overall um, increase that, in other words, the increase in the budget uh, allocation to health has been absorbed principally by the HSE yes. and not by an awful lot of yeah. two and a half thousand organisations. The other issue that, that's raised in the report, and can I just raise this which issue, and that's about insurance and the state claims agency. Um, and maybe you might outline the current position in relation to voluntary organisations in relation to insurance, the kind of cost you're talking about, because when people look at money that's going to organisations, they don't look at the overall cost, like simple things like the cost of le heating, light, uh, you know, um, rent of premises, mm. insurance. And just on the insurance issue, I mean, w we don't have any um, overall, um, I presume each voluntary organisation is getting insured independently. And do we now need to look at an overall um, uh, policy whereby any organisation, the two and a half thousand organisations which are providing a public service, whether or not we should now bring it in under one umbrella for insurance and as a result then that's a cost that can be absorbed in a better way. So I'm just wondering maybe you might outline your own positions on that. Yeah, I, I think it would be uh, <coughs> fair to say this is an issue that has been very pressing for all our organisations in terms of increased insurance costs. Um, it, 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 to be fair, the HSE has uh, facilitated in the past year a uh, piece of work involving um, a number of our organisations with the State Claims Agency where they've undertaken a detailed analysis both of our, the costs that we're incurring, particularly in employers and public liability. Um, and we, we literally have had that information just given to us. Um, what it clearly shows is that those costs have increased exponentially in the last number of years. Uh, we don't sit under the State Claims Agency. The, the, again, a differentiation. <coughs> the Section 38 agencies, disability agencies, were brought in under the State Claims Agency uh, some years ago. What that has had as an ongoing effect is that the actual insurance pool has decreased thus meaning that the ins private insurance companies sure. now are insuring the Section 39 agencies on the basis of a reduced pool and therefore our costs have gone up because we are not part of the state claims. So that has had a very significant effect for us. For some of us we are self-insuring, which is a, a very perverse place to find oneself in. Um, but there is no doubt the solutions to this, um, certainly they're being considered, but there certainly has been nothing forthcoming in terms of us being offered the same protections through the state claims as our Section 38 colleagues. And as I think Senator Dolan referenced, the difference between us is barely a slip of paper, uh, but yet we're expected through the same funding. And I think this comes back to the whole issue of costs and contracts. It's the same price for the same services, but that does not take account of that considerable increase that has come upon us in the last number of years as a result of a decision to take the 38s in under but, the state claims. But this is a, a reform that could be implemented it, easily enough. It would make a significant I, I, I'm difference. I'm just wondering, has there been correspondence with the department on it, or has it... Well, no, I think the stage? work that has just been recently completed, um, and, and I, I mean literally in the last week, uh, certainly could inform uh, the department to give consideration to that um, and certainly the evidence is now clearly there with regard to the impact on section 39 agencies with regard to insurance okay. part of the issue um, here is about again how section 39 organizations are seen by the state 
slightly differently to how Section 38 are seen. Okay. So our, our staff are paid differently um, and the insurance is treated differently. And I, I'm, I'm not sure, based on the work that's been done so far, that it would be that we could assume that we're going to come in under the state claims agency. If anything, I think it's going, it, that's not going to happen. And the best that may happen is that we work together to pool our insurance need and go to the market as a collaborative uh, and okay. rather than coming in under the state claims agency. And that may have some financial benefit. But it Sorry, may not be to the same benefit you, as coming in under the state claims agency. Would when you're talking about Section 39 organisations, how many organisations are you actually talking about in real terms, just roughly? Oh, 1,000. 2,000. About 2,000. 2,000. Yeah. 39 yeah. organisations. But, yeah. but yeah. We don't reality, represent all of them. If, if yeah. I could just yeah. draw attention to yeah. one thing in our report, because um, the fact that there are 2,000 is a lot of organisations, but over 50% of the funding goes to the top 30. So you yes, have some very you. big yeah. nationally um, operating, and then you have some very tiny ones which receive a very small amount of state funding. So <coughs> make that explanation clear. Yeah. Presumably on the insurance question, the, the proportion is, is, is similar in terms of what they would have to spend. Yes. Yeah. The larger organisations are bearing the, the major cost associated with this. Can I just ask one final question, and, that, and that's in relation to directors and boards. Uh, it's a huge challenge as I come from a legal background myself, I'm very much aware of it, and, and giving legal advice to people who are sitting on boards. Uh, what can we do in order to give support to those people who give up their time and still leave themselves very exposed? Um, by you know the, the decisions they have to make, and I'm just wondering what can be done for for those people um, as we currently uh, look at the structure that currently is there. Um, maybe I could kick off on that. Um, I mean, obviously the underlying problems have to be solved. Um, mm. the, the problem of risk of being accused of reckless trading is going to be there as long as there are deficits. But we did suggest that it would be probably financially worthwhile and certainly useful for the state to have um, to fund some kind of small support um, office for uh, the um, for the, the smaller voluntary organisations to provide training for board members, perhaps to um, support shared services. The insurance would be another example of that. And rather than having to deal with multiple individual problems, to provide a centrally funded service that would just help to take some of the burden in terms of admin and, and personal burden away from um, the organisations and help to get a more streamlined delivery um, coming through. So that would be one, I don't think terribly expensive, but very useful way of supporting. But the, 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 the biggest problem, and, and we had a lot of um, people made the point to us as well, that it's getting increasingly difficult to get people to go on boards because yep. of this problem, right, right. which shows that they take their duties responsibly and seriously. Um, and to solve that problem, you'll have to take away the underlying problem, which is that they there is a risk of reckless trading because the deficits are mushrooming and not being taken into account, not even being talked about. And then it will come out someday that there's um, a funding gap um, and people will think, well, how did that happen? But the warning signs have been there for a very long time. It's not, it's not a new or sudden problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, have I any further questions? Okay, um, I just want to say I'm obligated to offer you a break, uh, but it seems that we have uh, we've come to a conclusion. So, uh, on behalf of the committee, um, I want to thank our witnesses for coming in, and I want to thank you for sharing your uh, up-to-date uh, position with regard to your own organisations. But I, I would also like to thank the uh, the men and women who work providing the services, the ones that aren't here, um, and indeed the uh, the people that they are helping to try to live. Uh, their best life and, and realise uh, their own full potential. I think they, they do a, a job that is very often unremarked on and I think it should be remarked on maybe every day of the week. Um, okay, so um, obviously my thanks to Ms O'Mara, Ms Flynn, uh, Ms Dr Day, Professor Grimson, Mr O'Regan, uh, Ms Shakespeare, Ms O'Brien and Ms Kyo. And uh, this, uh, there is no other business. This meeting of the Joint Committee is now adjourned until the, Wednesday the 26th of June.